Indianapolis. It's Kevin and Query. I throw, you catch. It's not that hard, okay? All right, get the out of here. We're going to talk a lot about drills and fundamentals. Watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. On 93.5. Watch it. And 107.5. Oh, baby. The Fan. Yeah, it's certainly one of the Christmas days on the Kevin Bowen calendar. There's no denying that. And that was honestly before Mark Dykton dropped the news on us yesterday evening that Micah Shrewsbury will be joining the show today at 930. Jake, I must admit, it has crossed my mind, and I can't say I have too much experience in this realm. I'm not sure that I've ever spoken with um, with another man and said, Hey, welcome. You're the reason I took my shirt off. A couple weeks ago. <laughs> is that how you're going to start it off? Is that the is that the right way to kind of intro it? Or should we maybe go a little bit more professional? Uh, why start now? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just see how uncomfortable you can make him. Right? He doesn't... Uh, have st- you not met him before? No. No, I've not. I mean, I, mean, I know there are some you know, connections from an education standpoint in years past, but no, I've never... Uh, Never cross paths with him. But looking forward to the conversation. Seems like a very nice individual, first off, uh, and obviously someone that I am very excited um, about. So that is coming up at 9.30 today. Micah Shrewsbury going to join us, and in less than an hour, we will have the opening tee shot hit at Augusta National with Eldrick Woods putting a tee in the ground coming up just after 10 o'clock as the opening round of the 2023 Masters gets underway. So you were concerned about the weather, is that right? Weather starting tomorrow. Yeah, so today looks pretty good. Uh, tomorrow, though, rain, and then Saturday, like, super chilly. Um, I think it's honestly supposed to be a little bit warmer here than it is down in Augusta, Georgia. So, yeah, that is less than ideal for Tiger Woods. I mean, last year, he even shot 71, I think it was, in the opening round. Uh, was in the top 10. It was a great, great performance. And then all of a sudden, you know, a combination of body sustaining itself for 72 holes slash Mother Nature did not go well for him the rest of the tournament. So um, that is my concern. Mother Nature is who we're... Uh, Tiger's body, Jake, has more metal in it than probably the studio currently has. Um, so, yes, when you factor that in and the undulation of Augusta National and the difficulty it is to walk that golf course, then yes, unfortunately, that is reality with Tiger Woods right now. Uh, happy Thursday to everybody. A little chillier than yesterday, but hoping for a good start to the morning for everyone. Uh, my name is Jake Quarry. That is Kevin Bowen, who is wearing his Tiger shirt. Tiger is back, it says. That sits in Kevin's closet along with his We Are Back Indiana shirt from the Tom Crean era, right? Can't say I own one of those. No. Uh, it's Indiana, right? Isn't that what Tom Crean said several times That's during right. that press conference? He did say that. I forgot about that. It's Indiana. Um, it's Indiana. Mark Dykton here as well on a Thursday. And as you had mentioned, Micah Shrewsbury, uh, Micah Shrewsbury going to join us at 930. I thought you had said, Kevin, and don't get me wrong, I, I am happy that you are not following through. Maybe I'm wrong. Did you say something about wearing a Tiger Speedo if we had Michael Shrewsbury on the show? Oh, I don't think I went to that level. Um, I think you have to set pretty grand expectations to don a Speedo. I said if Tiger puts on a green jacket Sunday evening, then I will wear the Tiger Speedo. Okay. I don't Monday know why morning. I was thinking it was if we had Shrewsbury on the you show. You sound like someone that would like to see me in a no, Tiger Speedo. Absolutely I'm, I'm getting the hint Negatory. There. Negative. Are you hearing that, Mark? Because I'm, mean, I'm hearing a little bit of that. He definitely... Get his interest peaked. He's asking. He's wondering. He's curious. He's no. Like, what is it? What is it going was, to take to? Make I was this trying happen? to mentally prepare myself for the. I mean, I just cleansed my my retinas of the shirtless episode. I, so I've never been happier to be on vacation. To be quite honest. <laughs> Trust me. I forgot about that, Mark. Yeah, I missed it. I was I was just enjoying oh, you my time it, in Florida, right. and all of a sudden I, I was like, man, my phone's going crazy. What the heck? And I'm just seeing shirtless Kevin Bowen, and I'm like, uh, did I take my, ayahuasca? Uh, What's going on here? What's happening? My my brother wrote a letter to Micah Shrewsbury. Really? Uh huh. <laughs> you know, you and, gonna, and when my brother first told me this, are I, you going to be heartbroken if Micah Shrewsbury's like, I haven't gotten the letter yet? Uh, well, maybe a little bit, but you know, when I first heard this from my brother Ryan, I thought to myself, 
boy, I hope it had a different tone than remember when uh, the guy Tim Weaver wrote the letter to Trace Jackson Davis back in the fall. Yeah. Now, some might say at the time Indiana needed a little bit of a jolt, and maybe Tim Weaver provided that. I thought you know there might be a chance Mike Woodson might bring him into a post game locker room <laughs> to celebrate. Um, but you know Ryan has several connections to Micah Shrewsbury as well as a Cathedral grad, and Ryan is a, is a Butler grad, which I know Micah is a Hanover product, but obviously spent some time at Butler. But yes, I am really looking forward to the conversation. And Jake, I probably won't ask him necessarily this because it's kind of a wasted question, but. Is the first subtraction from Purdue this offseason going to be a Notre Dame addition? It's a good question. I There are a lot of... I, Brandon his, Newman into the transfer portal yesterday. And also, isn't he a South Bend native? He's a Valpo native? Valpo, yeah, northern Indiana. You know, Newman's an interesting one because... Shrewsbury need, would have been at Purdue, by the way, to recruit him. I, I, you I need that, that experience time. for Purdue, but at the same time... I think even though Purdue had an unbelievable year, Newman is a guy that I think at the beginning of the year there were probably higher expect. He had a decent year, but wasn't kind of more expected of him. I think you can make that statement for his entire career. Yeah, you know, you always were kind of wanting him to piece it together. You know, I th- felt like he had a he had a really nice high school career. Um, you know, was a pretty consensus kind of top you know hundred type guy, four star recruit. Um, you know, I thought when Purdue inserted him in the starting lineup late in the season, it, it made a lot of sense to me because, you know, I think he certainly can hold his own on the defensive end of the floor and then has that ability to give you a little bit more of a scoring spark. You just never could consistently string it together. Part of me was surprised he stayed at Purdue as long as he did. Now, do they, and pardon my naivete here, for those that are unfamiliar, Micah Shrewsbury's son is a is a big-time recruit that had committed for Penn State. Has that has he already officially said that? Uh, nothing official, but I believe the wording in the opening press conference, which you sure as hell bet I watched, maybe twice. Um, Braden's going to look good shooting a lot of threes in this building, I think was the phrase that Micah said in the press conference. So I would lend to think that the man controlling the scholarships probably is going to offer Braden a scholarship there. So yeah, nothing. I mean, Notre Dame has a ton of people in the transfer portal. Uh, they have like four or five, I think, mean, guys even on their roster. So I would assume a lot of that Penn State recruiting class, which does include his Ainsville product, Logan Imes, who, uh, you know, it remains to be seen where he is going to go, what will happen there. We, we got Indiana All-Stars announced earlier this week. Did we get – we haven't got Mr. Basketball. Did I miss that? I don't think we've had that yet. Correct, we? we've not. Uh, I assume it will be Marcus Burton from Penn. Uh, we'll be the first South Bend area native to win Mr. Basketball in quite some time. Um, and he is even throughout this vacancy in South Bend, he has maintained his commitment. So he will be an important piece for Micah Shrewsbury. Again, good Thursday morning to you. Mark Dykton is on it. He's got the Golf Channel on right behind Jake Query. I'm very happy about that. Uh, Pacers last night, they lose to the Knicks. Honestly, there are moments in that game where I'm like, oh boy, the Pacers might screw this up and win. Um, typical, no Halliburton, no Turner. You know, nothing sums up you are tanking like your best player appears on the TV broadcast. Right. Good point. <laughs> that was kind of the highlight last night with Tyrese Halliburton joining Kristen Airy and Quinn Buckner. It's like it's like the summer league all over again, right? Seriously. Like, yeah. And how about the Knicks? No Rand, no Julius Randle, no Jalen Brunson, and no R.J. Barrett. I, those are their top three players, right? Yes. Top three scorers, certainly. They had three dudes last night scored more than 30. And they were missing. The, t- the Knicks have kind of quietly put together a pretty decent year here, right? Especially by, by recent Knicks standards. I'm kind of looking forward to that Knicks-Cavs first-round matchup. Yeah. I, the NBA playoffs is going to be fantastic because it is literally... I, I mean, we talked about this yesterday, Kevin. But if you look at the, the East, I mean... Any of these three teams, Milwaukee, Boston, Philly, you can make an argument for any of those three coming out of the East, right? And then you go to the West. I'm, the West, throw a dart at the yeah, board, right? I mean, honestly, I think the – call me crazy. I'm, I'm willing to have the haters come out of the woodwork yelling at me on this. I think the favorite in the West for me is the Lakers, and they're the seven seed. But, Jake, in, in the play-in, does that worry you at all? I get it. That was a big loss last night. 
They lost the Clippers last night. The Clippers have won 11 in a row over the Lakers. Um, so, yeah, the standings out west with the regular season ending on Sunday continue to be very jumbled. The Mavericks and the Thunder are tied for the last spot. Again, those teams couldn't be going in different directions from a you know tanking win-now standpoint. In all honesty, if I'm being transparent, part of why this is totally unfair, part of why I think the West seems so wide open is because it's three best teams by – seed are Denver, Memphis, and Sacramento. And those are just three teams that you don't typically think of as taking hold of a conference. Yeah, those aren't the Blue Bloods. Right. Which I love. Totally agree. I love. The NBA has, especially out west this year, has found a little bit of parity that we're not used to. What NBA team would you say that we have mentioned the fewest times this season? We have mentioned the fewest times the Washington Wizards. That's exactly who I'm sitting here looking at. I'm like, I I don't know that we've mentioned them once. You know the even when the Pacers played him, we like didn't talk about it. He's been an absolute bust, and again, it's one year. Is Johnny Davis? Yeah, that th- that tradition continues, right? What he did in Bloomington and West Lafayette certainly was quite the statement the way, as a collegian. But speaking of uh, t-shirts, and I'm glad that you're wearing one today. Can I show you what somebody sent me? Oh wow, you're gonna unzip the jacket here. Hang on. Hang on, I gotta stand up here. Oh, this is Tom Crean. No, close. Oh, wow. Why that. not Indiana? Look at that. Rose Company Clothing, which I think is out of southern Indiana. Uh, I, I got this kind of randomly in the mail, and it just said, Hey, just had fun making this for you. Check me out on Facebook, well, Elizabeth Rose. Care to okay. describe it for our um uh, it is simply a black t shirt with the outline of the state of Indiana at the top. Like across the Michigan border, it just says, why not? And then on what would be the, what is that, the far eastern border, it just says Indiana. So why not Indiana, baby? I like it. That's simple, yet effective. It is. It is. Wait till I get my trademark. We'll be printing these bad boys off like no tomorrow. I'm selling those in turn three coming up here <laughs> in late May. Scott, Can you imagine I- if I turned the platform into just a little t-shirt shack up there? <laughs> yeah, we got a caution. I'm going to go down there and... Sell some shirts. I'm a radio host by morning, and at day, nighttime I sell T-shirts out of my car. <laughs> well, right now at nighttime I'm a, I'm a, uh, finishing my geology homework. I spent a lot of time last night on a lab on groundwater. I think I took geology in college as well. It's probably my favorite class I've taken, to be honest with you. Really? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Did you know that fresh water is found? Groundwater is the l- leading source of fresh water on Earth. I did know that. Yeah. Give that to me Can again. I, Groundwater uh-huh. is the leading has more water than any freshwater reservoir on Earth. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Just thought I'd throw that to you. Scott Agnes at eight thirty, Zach Kiefer at nine o'clock, and of course Micah Shrewsbury at nine thirty on the Zach Kiefer front. Uh, Will Levis, that is the reported workout for the Colts today. I think the picture went around yesterday of a Colts plane in the Gainesville area to view one Anthony Richardson. Um, so if you look at Levis, they will have rounded out each of these four quarterback workouts here in what is just a monumental week. Again, next week the offseason program starts, so Shane Steichen's focus will, a large chunk of his time, will be um, centered around the actual football team, and, and you'll get you know a, a ton of players coming back to Indianapolis for the start of the offseason program. Strength and conditioning is the early focus on that, but a lot of meetings and really Shane's first time actually being a head coach from a behind-the-scenes kind of closed-door standpoint there. Uh, But Will Levis, that will be the workout today for the Colts. You know, Kevin, a, um interesting anecdote to my afternoon, but I thought you'd get a kick out of this. So I think people know this because if you listen to this radio station, you hear like yesterday we had on Dick Gabriel, we had Nestor on from Baltimore. You know, that's not uncommon that we, and I'm assuming the same is true for you, Kevin, that you get radio stations from across the country that maybe you have some sort of history with or that you've done hits for in the past, and they call and they're like, hey, any chance you can come on for 10 minutes on Wednesday and talk about the Colts or the Pacers or IU or whatever, right? So one of those, it's a station that I think I did maybe some things previewing indie races in Pocono, but it's out of Pennsylvania, scranton Wilkesbury, I think, area of Pennsylvania. And they sent me a thing yesterday, and they said, hey, and this is a, a cool thing. 
They said we actually do a mock draft with the first like ten picks in the draft, where we have a person on that covers each or talks about each team. Would you be willing to come on Thursday in the third or the fourth slot for the Colts? And I said, yeah, sure. And they said, so we'll, we have somebody from Phoenix coming on before you, somebody from Houston coming on before them, and somebody obviously, or and somebody from Carolina coming on, you know, Charlotte before yeah. them. Yeah, sounds great. And they go, great. We'll do about 12 minutes talking about who the Colts, what the Colts' needs are, and then you tell us who they will take at that position based on who's been taken. I go, okay. <laughs> I'm taking 12 minutes. And they said... You're literally on the clock. They said, well, we can tell you already that C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young are both going to be off the board. Well, it's not going to take me 12 minutes to tell you uh, which who went three, because that'll tell you right now who's going fourth. It's one of the two. Now, if... if if Phoenix does not, or if Arizona, I should say, does not take a quarterback, then that means it's up to me to decide which of the two the Colts would go with. And I guess that's the the variable. And that would be the first time in NFL history, right? If someone trades up to three, we've never had quarterbacks go one, two, three, and four? That probably is right. Yeah. And that, and again... It feels like, Kevin, that's simply because there are four teams that in that big a need of a quarterback as opposed to there are four franchise quarterbacks in the league. You know, one of those four sure. is going to flame out. Who knows which one? Yeah, the demand is certainly – supply and demand there with the four quarterbacks. Let me ask you this. if, And, and it's an four. unfair comparison because maybe I'm just saying it because they played at the same university. But if Bryce Young – is Tua without the injury history. Are you cool with that as a number one overall pick? Um is too like Yeah. I I'd probably like a little bit more. And I guess to be fair to Tua, he's still what? Three years in I mean he's still right. relatively young, so he could, you know, take another jump, but yeah, it, it, it it's a nice floor. I would like a little bit more. You know, a lot of the comparisons with C.J. Stroud is Dak Prescott. That's not bad, right? Now, again, it's a number one pick. You can certainly point to a lot of QBs that he have not been more Dak Prescott taking number one. You can point to a lot of others that have been better than Dak to Prescott. To me, C.J. Stroud seems more like offensively fluid than Dak Prescott. Like yeah, Prescott, I, to me, seems a little bigger and bulkier, and Stroud seems to me to be a little more nimble. Well, certainly he showed that in the national semifinal. Um, you know, again, I, I know we talked about this yesterday with Anthony Richardson, the comparisons to Lamar Jackson in college, the comparisons to Cam Newton. You know, someone was mentioning to me yesterday, you know, look, uh, he can be Jalen Hurts. Like, do people forget what Jalen Hurts did in college? The dude threw 80 touchdowns. Yeah. 67% passer. Like, I, I feel like at times we just, we look at Richardson and the only reason to take him is because he looks good in shorts and t-shirts. I found out everything I needed to know about Jalen Hurts if I was an NFL executive. When Jalen Hurts was playing in the national championship game against Georgia, struggled, and on, I think it was the final drive, they put in Tua, who threw the game-winning touchdown, and the most excited person on the sidelines and the first to greet Tua was Jalen Hurts. That kind of told me everything I needed to know about Jalen Hurts. And again, I know a lot of people can like poke fun at some of that stuff, Jake, but that is what is the separator for the Colts. That Those sorts of attributes. How you are as a teammate, your work ethic, those sorts of things. Um, that is what this week is all about for Shane Steichen and company. Um, I, I think if we look at, and again, you went, where did you say you went? Sam Burns, Hideki Matsuyama, Cameron Young. Yep, that's those it. Those are the three picks. Yep. Jake, I almost feel this way, and again, this is obviously well before qualifying anything like that. You know, I would say in some order right now, your favorites of the Indy 500 would be like a Pato Award, Joseph Newgarden, Scott Dixon. Is that fair? Yeah, I'd probably put Scott McLaughlin in there too, but yes, that's fair. It almost seems like in the Masters, we've got like a three. We, we, we've got a Scotty Scheffler, Rory McIlroy, John Rahm, and then a big drop to the next tier. So it's interesting to see from a betting odds standpoint how people have viewed that. Scotty Scheffler, the defending champ, we 
haven't had many defending champs defend their title at the Masters, but um, he's actually playing better golf entering this year's Masters than he did entering last year. Of course, Rory uh, completing the Grand Slam and the whole live debate. Did we ever get rivalries, IRL, cart, individual rivalries? I would say no. Amongst one another, not cross, right? Well, in the in the early year of the split, like Eddie Cheever was pretty outspoken about cart itself. And then Jimmy Vassar on the cart side, you know, was like, who needs milk anyway? But there was like, never... Like, did we ever get 10 laps was to never, go, and here's the IRL guy, and here's the cart guy, oh, and, and, and let's build up that drama. Okay, the only time that would have been the case, great question, truth be told, was probably the 01 Indy 500 when you had both Penske and Ganassi cars come over. And so you had Nicholas Manassen and Tony Stewart and I'm thinking who the other one would have been. Bruno Giancara, I guess, driving, I think it was Giancara, driving for Ganassi and then obviously Elio and Gilles DeFerrin and the cart drivers finished like five of the top six spots. And that that kind of brewed it, but that was it, really. I mean, there, there wasn't a lot of cross-pollination. There were... Basically, to be truthful, once the doors opened up in CART and IRL running in the same Indy 500, there were only really three of them where the top teams were represented as CART teams, and then the unification happened eventually, and that was that. Yeah, I mean, there are some people, I think, in the golf world that you know believe it would be good for the sport. I think the overwhelming majority thinks... The split is not good for the sport. I would probably agree with that. But I think there are some people that are going to say, hey, this split is not going to be put back together anytime soon. So if it's not, let's play up the rivalry. Let's I, let, let's play up Liv versus PGA Tour. Let's get Rory and whatever, Patrick Reed on the back nine on Sunday, and let's put a little but Venom against Hero matched up. Here's the difference, Kevin. The difference is this. Number one, golf is... And the stars of golf, notably Tiger Woods, are more on the radar to begin with than open wheel racing was in 1996. Now, the 1995 Indy 500 was massive. Don't get me wrong. And and open wheel racing was huge at that time. And, and the was, split occurred officially after that? Well, the split was announced in 94, and then in 96 is when it happened. Because in 96 was the first year that Tony George said you cannot run the Indianapolis 500 unless you're a member of the Indy Racing League. So you had the Indianapolis 500 in 1996 was made up entirely of drivers and teams that were full-time members of the Indy Racing League. And CART, instead of just buying into that, CART said, fine, we'll run our own race in Michigan called the US 500 on the same day. So you had a line, a very clear line in the sand from that time and so therefore you had like four indianapolis 500s that were strictly indy racing league teams that were running in it and then some modifications were some some leniency was granted that allowed teams to come over in a one-off if you will my point being in golf number one tiger woods is a bigger name in sports even though he's obviously in the twilight of his career but he is still a bigger name than probably any driver was in open wheel racing in 96 because sure. Mario had retired, you know, because of retirements. But in addition to that, you still have the Indianapolis 500s of golf still have the live golfers in it. You know, it it's not like the master said you can only run, you can only yeah. play in. So the analogy would be, my long-winded point here, the analogy would be 100% if the PGA said you can only play in the Masters if you are a PGA golfer. And if you are a live golfer, you cannot be in the Masters. And therefore, live said, fine, we'll have our own tournament this weekend at Pebble Beach. That would be the equivalent of a split. But it was – open wheel racing suffered greatly from it. There's no question. And NASCAR benefited from it. No question about it. Because people went, wait a minute, what's going on here? What is this? What? There wasn't enough interest, full throttle in open wheel racing at that time for people to wade through and figure out which series they were watching. 
That's the easiest way to say it. If you don't want to be productive at work the next two days, just download the Masters app. <laughs> it's an incredible viewing experience. Not to get too like app nerdy with people, but it's like voted one of the best apps annually. You know, uh, it's so special been, about it. It, it. Well, just great access in terms of um, the amount of shots you can see, the amount of groups you can watch. You know, Masters is really unique in that over the course of an hour, uh, there's only four minutes of commercials. By which, the way, you know, imagine watching a sporting event and watching it for an hour and only have four minutes of commercials. Uh, Derek points out the 2002 finish had major IRL cart undertones. Yeah, that was the year I'm talking about, 2002, when Manassin came over, Tony Stewart. Uh, they had the rain delay, but it was... Is that DeFerrin? Elio? DeFerrin was 03. It was Elio's second win, yeah. Um, 2000, Montoya versus Greg Ray got a lot of play. I think The difference being in 2000, you didn't have the Penske cars there, and Montoya was so much better than everybody else. I'll never forget Robin Miller, the morning of the, of the Indy 500, seeing him in the media center. And, you know, Montoya, Greg Ray was on the pole. And I said, hey, do you think this Greg Ray can win it? Robin looked at me like I had in Robin's way and said, son, I'm telling you right now, this, this Montoya is going to beat everybody by two laps. You really think so? It's the greatest, greatest natural talent to come through here in years, son. Okay. And the only driver that I've seen Robin Miller have more, like, admiration for early in their career was Kyle Larson. Those Montoya and Kyle Larson are the two guys that, that Robin Miller told me before anybody else knew who they were. Like, look, these guys are going to be the next big thing. He was right. Larson's who we got next year, right? Correct. For two years, correct? Indy Correct. 2024 and 2025. Gosh, the month of May, Jake. Three and a half weeks away. That's the best. That is Jake Quarry's Christmas morning. It's also up there on my Christmas list. Today is mine. The opening round again of the Masters will officially get underway at 8 o'clock. We'll have some opening tee shots. Um, and then Mike Weir and Kevin Na will get things started at 8 o'clock. When does Sandy Lyle tee off? Oh, he's that's, got, my, that's my tune in. Sandy, they usually put him uh, at times that you wouldn't consider to be premium. Uh, 824 for the suspender clad Sandy Lyle. Hmm. A VJ Singh at 812. The pride of Fiji. Talk about fresh water. Uh, the 02 race, by the way, was also the Tracy Castro Nevis year. So, yeah, that had some. Hmm. That was a pretty big deal because Castro Nevis by then was an IRL driver and Tracy was still in cart and yada, yada, yada. Quite the finish that year. Uh, okay. All right, I'm Kevin Bowen, Jake Query, Mark Dykton. Um, as Jake said, Certainly not the humidity-stricken day that it was yesterday walking out to the car. You're going to need a jacket today. It looks like temps in the 50s, but then certainly uh, really the next week looks really nice here from a weather standpoint. A uh, good Thursday morning to you. Kevin and Corey right here on 93.5, 107.5, The Fan.
Concert Pit and VIP tickets on sale now at IMS.com. The Morning Checkdown. Omaha! 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 On 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. Obviously, some masters to talk about. We'll be, we will begin with the, I would say the stick and ball sports, but I guess golf is literally a stick and ball sport. Uh, Knicks last night, 138-129 over the Pacers. That is a five-game win streak for New York. For the Pacers, Jalen Smith had 19, TJ McConnell 18, as the blue and gold now 34 and 46. They have Detroit coming up on Friday at the Fieldhouse, then closing things out in the Garden on Sunday against those same Knicks. Elsewhere in the NBA last night, Brooklyn, Atlanta, Boston, Milwaukee, New Orleans, Dallas, and the Clippers, all winners. Clippers beating the Lakers. Last night's leading score in the NBA. Any wager of a guess there, Mark? Jaron Jackson Jr. Let's go with the uh, with the Nick, right? Emmanuel Quickly? <laughs> Emmanuel Quickly had 39. Very quickly was the answer from Mark Dykton. Did you know the answer to that? I did know. Jaron Jackson Jr. with 40 last night. Team, so. Boy, he's had a couple big ones here. You have a fantasy here. team? Yeah. As of I'm in a fantasy championship. Oh, thanks My for team's 19-1. You guys have got oh. fantasy basketball teams? Yeah. it's yeah. Actually, it's, Gosh, you guys it's are a, bigger nerds than I am. I, you know what? I think it's a super fun way to just keep track of what's going mm-hmm. on, right? Yeah. I do fantasy baseball, too, and that is that is exhausting. My, my team now in fantasy basketball, nerd, I guarantee you my fantasy basketball team is better than yours. Oh, probably. It's mm-hmm. stacked. Yeah. Well, you're nineteen and one. I have Jaron Jackson. Also, I also have LeBron James, Joel Embiid, Markel Fultz. They should um, clip this segment here. This is Ky- our most Kyrie Irving, radio Irving, we've had. In Kyrie years. Irving, Anthony Edwards, Brooke Lopez, and Andrew Wiggins. No! <laughs> On the tank watch for the Pacers right now. For those um, that are still listening, <laughs> the Pacers and the Wizards tied in the six-seven spot at five. You have the Trailblazers one game ahead of Washington, Indiana, Portland is at eight, one game behind. So it is a very jumbled, again, five, six, seven, eight. And for those curious percentage chances, uh, if you have the fifth pick or the fifth lottery odds, 42% at a top four pick. If you have the eighth pick, that would be the 26% odds. So significant change, five to eight. Uh, Major League Baseball. Cubs and Reds were postponed due to rain, and trust me, there were like 200 people that were disappointed by that. Uh, Braves over the Cardinals 5-2 yesterday. It was the Brewers over the Mets 7-6. Taking a look, though, at our little sweepstakes here for the PBR. Cute fella, short end, 5-2. The Rangers win. Oakland A's also yesterday beaten by the Cleveland Guardians 6-4. Your Diamondbacks were idle, right, Mm -hmm. Mark? Yeah, I think they were off yesterday. Did I already see four games postponed for today already? Indians rained out. Indianapolis Indians rained out yesterday as well. Yeah, probably, yeah. I mean, the yeah. I mean, Cincinnati and Philadelphia has already been postponed. So Baltimore, New York, that would be the Mets. Um, so basically what we got in the Midwest yesterday, kind of be projecting towards the East Coast. So a lot of cancellations already in Major League Baseball for today. Yeah. Hope that sound is not happening when Tiger Woods tees off here coming up <laughs> just after 10 o'clock. Here was Tiger earlier in the week down at Augusta National on – that inevitable question of when will it be the last one quick follow-up when you're playing this course does it ever cross your mind this could be the last time yes it has um i i didn't know i mean last year was kind of uh um didn't know if i was, I was going to play again at that time uh, for some reason everything kind of came together and i kind of pushed it a little bit and i was able to make the cut which was nice and uh yeah i, I don't know how many more i have in me so the, just to be able to appreciate the, the, the time that I have here and, and cherish the, the memories. It's definitely a different sounding Tiger uh, when asked those sorts of questions um, than in previous years. He has never missed a cut as a professional at Augusta National. That's 22 in a row. He would tie the record if he's able to make the cut here coming up this weekend. <laughs> You want that tiger out on the course. Great sound, Mark. That is a cool sound. We should let him walk with a live tiger. You know that when Clemson, can carry the when Clemson brings the buses around the for the team to run down the hill at Clemson Memorial Stadium, the whole always stadium nervous. has that audio. I'm always nervous Dabo's going to tear an Achilles when he does They've that. had players do that. They've had players get hurt running down the hill. Dabo really is a big sprinter. <laughs> when I see him, I'm like, could he challenge Usain Bolt? No, he could not. Thank, is you, Usain thank Bolt, you for clarifying that for is, me. Is Usain Bolt still the fastest man in the world? Uh, I believe he retired, correct? 
But it, would he still be? He still has the records, though, right? I think about yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. I think about this, and you know, this sounds like a great July topic. You ever think about like people that have been born at the right and or wrong time? Totally. Like Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps could not have been born at a better time in terms of their peaks allowing for Olympic success. Like they wouldn't have maybe had, yes, they would have had Olympic success, of course, but not as longevity filled given the four year cycles. And obviously, if you are, I mean, hell, if you're Phil Mickelson, you were, if Phil Mickelson's born into some different golf eras, he has more dominance than he had totally. with Tiger. Well, I mean, from a team standpoint, the Indiana Pacers were birthed at the wrong time in terms of their NBA prominence because they just so happened to put together their two best eras yep. during the peak of Michael Jordan and LeBron James. I mean, I, you know. Say a similar thing about the Colts with Tom Brady. Yeah. And the Patriots. We'll talk some Pacers. We'll talk some Masters. We'll talk some Colts. We'll do a little bit of everything. I will keep my shirt on. I, I feel like Thank I have you. to, right? You need to be a professional. I can get you a Why Not Indiana shirt when you have to put one back on after that Tiger is back when he doesn't make the cut. Mike well, Shrews and you're going to like it. <laughs> Mark, when we pitched to get him on, did you mention anything about Mike Shrewsbury? Yeah, I said, I said, yeah. I said, our, our one of our hosts, Kevin, is a huge Notre Dame fan. He took his shirt off because he got hired. That was in the wording? Yeah. Oh, boy. I can give you the email thread if you'd like. Well. That's probably why it took a little bit for them to get back to me. Mm-hmm, yeah. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Shrewsbury joins us less than two hours. Kevin and Quarry here on an overcast Thursday.
The Fan. Michael Shrewsbury going to join us coming up at 9.30. Uh, Brandon Newman in the transfer portal for Purdue. That is the first name uh, for Purdue. You think of Zach Eady? Declares there could be some impact, or excuse me, if he returns, there could be some uh, impact on Trey Kaufman Wren potentially in the transfer portal. I would think because I think Kaufman Wren's a good player and played well when he had opportunities. And it's no knock on really anybody. There's just kind of a log jam there, right? Because Caleb first plays well with Edie in the starting lineup, and I, you know, I thought Wren played well when his number was called, but. Especially considering he he redshirted the first year, you know he probably was anticipating a, a larger slice of the pie, um, and has done all the right things to this point. So that would not surprise me because, it, like I said, there just seems to be kind of a logjam, right? Yeah, we'll have to see how things play out there. You know, that's probably the one big declaration from a local standpoint we've yet to hear about. Uh, obviously, Trace Jackson Davis, Jalen Huchifino, both declaring for the draft. Um. Earlier this week, I saw it was kind of going around social media Monday night into Tuesday, Jake, about looking closer at Danny Hurley and what he did at UConn or has done and maybe a little bit of a slower process than a lot of people believe. Um, Something JMV and I were talking about yesterday, I think a difference between Hurley through two seasons, which he did not make the tournament either of his first two years at UConn. Mike Woodson's first two years in Bloomington. Obviously, Woodson he got in the tournament last year in the play-in. You know, won a game in the tournament this year. Finally, had a respectable finish in the Big Ten compared to where the program's been over the last you know five to ten years. If you look at the core of UConn's national title team this season, those recruits were getting on campus right now. In that year three, like Adama Sinogo, Andre Jackson, you know, their leaders, the guys that Hurley talks about the most. Then the following recruiting class was Jordan Hawkins, who you know, is going to hear his name called probably in the top half of round one. Alex Caravan, another starter. And Jake, that to me would be the big difference between trying to compare Woodson's situation to UConn and Danny Hurley. I used certainly had more on court success than Danny Hurley had his first two seasons. But Jake, right now going into year three, it's portal, portal, portal for Indiana. Yep. It's not talk about incoming recruits. And if you look at UConn, they had portal guys certainly this year, but the core, the bulk, the vast majority were guys that you recruited, were in your program for several seasons, and eventually they got to the point of cutting down the debts on Monday night. So that, to me, is the big difference between the two. Yeah, I think that Connecticut is just fascinating to me, Kevin, because it just is a program that, you know, maybe it's because of where it's based, but I don't, you know, somebody said to me, they're like, well, UConn's basically New York City. And I'm like, well, it's, that's like saying Purdue's basically Chicago. You know what I mean? I mean, it's an hour and it's in the middle of a farmland an hour and a half outside of New York City. But what UConn has done that I think Indi- where Indiana aired is a couple of things. Now, Kevin Ollie got into some snafus, if I'm not mistaken. But when they went from Jim Calhoun to Kevin Ollie, Kevin Ollie won a title. And then as soon as Kevin Ollie slipped or things looked like it was getting away from him, they cut bait right there. They didn't sit there and say, we're going to get, you know, come out and at the football game, hold his hand up for a big big extension, let the crowd go crazy and commit a bunch of money they couldn't live up to. That They just said, we've got to have a direction. And they went and got a guy that had taken the proper steps. You know, Archie Miller was – I can't damn Indiana for hiring Archie Miller because at the time I thought it was a good hire, and obviously it was not. Now, I think you can blame Indiana for not doing a more thorough – search when they hired Archie Miller and, and letting somebody else blow them away. But Danny Hurley has East Coast roots. He coached on the East Coast at Rhode Island, which is a step just below Connecticut and had success. So there was a clear vision and they went out and they and then they said, you know, 
give it three years or whatever else, and here they are. And, I mean, Kevin, at this point, is there any reason to believe that Connecticut drops off? No, I mean, they've got a great recruiting class coming in next year. I don't think they're going to lose too much. From this I think it's just team. about it's about having a definitive vision and sticking by it and looking like you've got a plan. Well, and again, I, I think you got to have homegrown talent. The 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 portal and to steal the Dane Fife phrase, it can be the portalette. And I mean, Indiana and Purdue here locally. I mean, how Butler last year. I mean, you can it can look bad, and it has looked bad in some instances with you know several of the programs right here in our own backyard. I I do think. It, I don't really have a feeling on this one way or the other, Jake, so I'll, I'll toss it to you. Do you think Mike Woodson's NBA background would help Indiana from a get guys into your program via the portal and make that chemistry a little bit smoother? I think that Indiana thought or convinced themselves that Mike Woodson being an NBA coach was going to immediately resonate. And... I think Indiana was probably a little bit naive about two things. Number one, and I realize Mike Woodson coached in the NBA in Atlanta and New York primarily, right? But he to say that Mike Woodson was like a ubiquitous NBA, you, you know, when you think of NBA coaches, you think of like Popovich and Spolstra and Steve Kerr and like Thibodeau, right? Like. Woodson was a rather anonymous NBA coach, truthfully, to like a 15- or 16-year-old kid. But I get that he can walk in there and say, but let me show you who I've worked with, what I've done, whatever. And again, guys have sung his praises from an NBA standpoint. And that's the thing. is that. So in other words, what I'm getting at, Kevin, is I, I, when, when Woodson first got to Indiana, I don't think that that really was a huge factor. But now that he has developed, like Hood Shafino – Jalen Hutchfino developed under him. I mean, he did. Yeah, that's good. Trace Jackson Davis definitely did. And so now I do think, yes, that that does resonate because to Indiana's credit and to Mike Woodson's credit, there's now, I I think that there is some some validity to like, hey, listen, let me me show you these two guys that are going in the first round. You know, the smartest thing that John Calipari's ever done, and and the fact that Tom Crean didn't do this, I, I have always said this, Tom Crean should have been fired from Indiana before he was anyway. But he should have been fired when Cody Zeller and Victor Oladipo were both drafted in the top five picks in the NBA draft, and the first coach to shake their hand as they were walking up to the podium was John Calipari. John Calipari made the NBA draft for about a five-year stretch there, the John Calipari show, so that you could see how many players from Kentucky were getting drafted into the NBA. Crean really wasn't there? I don't remember Crean being there. Calipari was definitely there. I, I, as a matter of fact, I'm certain Crean was not there. Somebody will prove me wrong, I'm sure, but... But Calipari is always there. He's always at the draft in the green room because he's got five players going, and and kids see that. Now, in terms of Woodson and, and, and as a player, and you know, like, oh, well, he's a legend. You got to think of this: Mike Woodson finished his playing career at Indiana in 1980. A kid right now, how old is a top recruit? Like, what age right now are you recruiting? That's like a sixteen five star. Okay, sixteen years 17. old. Seventeen. So that kid was born in 07. Okay. What year were you born, Kevin? Uh, 89. So Mike Woodson is to today's recruit what Dick Van Arsdale was to you. I, you you've heard the name, Yeah, right? I took a history of Indiana high school basketball class at IU, so yeah, that was a big focus one day. So, but my point being, Woodson has done a really good job of now there is some proof in the pudding there. And again, Hood Shafino will be huge for him and an example of developing, like Correct. you said, turning him into a lottery pick, um, that will be... And he had, the, I mean, he was on the radar for sure, but this year he really he did develop. And I know that, listen, I, I totally get that people are screaming at their car radio right now, like, what are you talking about develop? Like, that guy was totally inconsistent. I get it. But in terms of the skill... Now, the other thing that's tough, Kevin, and this is what's a challenge for any coach, is your job as a coach... This is the catch-22 of being a college basketball coach in 2023, okay? And that is, is your job as a coach to create NBA players or to make the best college basketball team that you can make? Well, the reality is in 2023, more so than in 1990, in 2023, to make a great college basketball team, you need a player or two that are NBA players. 
and you need to let them know that your place is what springboards them to the NBA, and you need to cash in on the limited amount of time, pardon the pun, that they are going to be on campus for you. And so you have to have that balance of guys like Race Thompson, like Caleb First, that are really good college basketball players that are going to be four- or five-year guys for you, intermixed with players like Jaden Ivey and intermixed with players like Jalen hood Shafino that are NBA one-and-done guys and hope it meshes together. It, Kentucky, when Calipari won it in, in the year that he got it done with Kentucky in 2012, yes, they had an unbelievable team with Anthony Davis and Michael Kidd-Gilchrist, but they also had senior leadership on that team of guys that were four-year players. Yeah, it has Lamb, to be a mix. Terrence Jones, right. important guy. Jones, not a four-year guy, but yeah, they were uh, they were important. Darius Miller um, as well. Um, again, for IU, I think on their own roster right now, Caleb Banks, CJ Gunn, a couple guys that you know, developing them, um, getting them to grow as they ascend into bigger roles, much needed when you lose about 90% of your scoring. Um, speaking of Jalen hood Chafino, NBA draft, etc., I know Kurt wanted to talk about the Pacers draft. Kurt, good morning, man. How are you? Hey, good morning, guys, from a chilly 39-degree Arkansas. How are you? It is a little chilly here compared to uh, compared to yesterday, but we're we're doing good, man. Yeah, Jake, I I think you need to get those t-shirts on sale at the t-shirt shop in Broder. You like those? I'm telling you, <laughs> that'd be good. I, can you one. see it on the YouTube here? It's the Why Not Indiana t-shirt. Actually, I've not seen it yet. I'm just finishing my commute into the office. So. All right, fair enough. We'll check it out. It's it's we'll, Kurt will send you one. How's how that? Are the candy bars, Kurt? <laughs> There you go. There you go. Hey, uh, Jake. I also think you need to you need to grab that audio from your Scranton Colts draft so that we can all check that out and see if you uh, make the right pick. Are you allowed to trade up or back? I, I see. That's what I should. You know what I should do. And for those that are just joining us, I mentioned earlier this morning. I'm doing a Scranton, Pennsylvania radio hit today. That is a mock draft, and I'm following the guy, somebody from an Arizona station, and then. Obviously, a Carolina station first, and then Houston. I, should I call and trade with the Arizona radio guy and move up a spot? <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. Then he goes after me, so he goes at five thirty, and I go at five fifteen. Now I, I don't know how that works. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, the last thing I wanted to mention: um, Pacers in the draft position. So this is how sad it's been. I was actually looking at the schedules of these other three teams to see where they could eke out a win for our draft position. <laughs> And uh, I think we're going to point to that Friday night win over the Thunder as the game that went the wrong way since we won that game because I think that's going to keep us in about eight. And if we had lost Friday night, we'd probably end up in that fifth spot. So I think there's a big difference. And, uh, you know, we suffered through the bad season. We might as well have a better draft position. So just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that. No, I think that's it's a good, good point, Kurt. And you look ahead to Friday, Jake, it's the Pistons. So, I mean, that would indicate a, a game that, Obviously, Indiana could very well win. They've lost six of seven, so you obviously have done a nice job from a tank standpoint uh, here lately. But, yeah, the win over the Thunder, potentially the win on Friday against Detroit. It's Detroit and New York. Uh, New York on Sunday afternoon will conclude the regular season. But five, six, seven, and eight right now in the tank standings, separated by one game. And if you just go off last year's draft, Jaden Ivey five, Benedict Mather in six. Shaden Sharp seven. Dyson Daniels eight. Again, I know it's just one draft, but five to eight, pretty big difference. Here we go with a little uh, mock draft simulation. Jaden Ivey's had a great rookie year, by the way. By the way. Just did it. You ready? Pacers were currently sitting at seventh. With the eighth pick in the 2023 NBA Tankathon draft, the Indiana Pacers select Anthony Black from the University of Arkansas. Kurt will be driving him tomorrow for a press conference. <laughs> what do they've got? Uh, what do they got? The UConn kid Hawkins going. Uh, Hawkins right now is listed as the 16th pick in the draft, Damn. two spots ahead of Jalen Hood Shafino. I like what I saw there. I, I would tend to agree with that. I like what I saw there. Um, all right, coming up at 8.30, we'll talk more Pacers with Scott Agnes, Zach Kiefer at 9 o'clock. Micah Shrewsbury going to join us at 9.30. I'm going to be a professional. I'm going to keep the shirt on. Some people say yeah, that I can't go. do it. I'm going to do it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Very professional. Mm -hmm. Mark, how's it?
bit unnecessary. But although Tiger is teeing off in a couple hours. Uh, uh, Kevin eight. and Query on a Thursday. <laughs> 107. Seven five. The fan. Eight o'clock on a Thursday. Good morning to you, Jake Query, along with Kevin Bowen, Mark Dykton here as well. It's Kevin and Query. Took them uh, two and a half weeks with the consulting group to come up with the name of the program on a Thursday. Um, one quick note before we get into talking about the Masters, which Kevin's got on his Tiger shirt today. Do you like it? The shirt. It actually is kind of cool. I mean, it's a little outdated, but I like both of our shirts because it today. says Tiger is back. And well, is he not playing today, Jake? <laughs> Okay. It seems like an accurate statement to me. Um, I'd like to read this tweet from Jim. I'm so excited he's playing. Jim? Well, I'm excited to hear Jim's thoughts, too. Uh, Jim says, hey, Jake, I wanted to say thank you for being up front and disclosing your heart attack to fellow listeners. I had a heart attack on Sunday morning. The pain woke me up. I live alone. I debated calling for help and ignored it, thinking it would go away. Being a man, my pride and ego was preventing me from calling for help. Finally, I overcame my ego and called 911. I'm glad I did. I got to the hospital quickly and received the care I badly needed. My point is, when something doesn't feel right, absolutely call for help. Totally agree, Jim, number one. Number two, um, 
certainly wish and hope everybody can join me in wishing the best for Jim's recovery. Amen. And at least in my case, um, there was no denying what was going on, and I can't possibly imagine, um, in my case, it was not an option. But, yes, if you feel like something is you, uh, unusual and notably, in my case at least, a total cuffed type feeling of my left arm going completely numb followed by the feeling that somebody was pouring hot water into my sternum <laughs> if you feel that um no need to be a hero yeah don't be a hero get, get call 911 and get an and the other thing is get an ambulance because they can get things going and radio ahead and and facilitate for your treatment right away um kevin I'm masters very excited by the way that jim shared that statement because that means he did get the help that he needed that's right uh so wish the best for jim and um Certainly, my line is open for any questions he might have moving forward. So, with the Masters, Kevin, a couple of questions. I, you know, I've seen a lot of people posting pictures of their trip. My buddy Rex um, sent a picture yesterday. He's down in Augusta. Have you been to Augusta, did you say? Yeah, 2011, went to rounds two and three. Um, and then 2019, the year Tiger won, we went to the two. Oh, gosh, Mark. Just soothing. You listen to this like before you go to sleep. Not gonna lie, I kind of do want to take off my shirt now. All of a sudden, after hearing this, that's frowned upon at Augusta, I think. Uh, very much so. Very much so. Uh, 2019, Jake, the Tuesday practice round. A little rainy, unfortunately, that day. But uh, going to the tournament uh, Friday and Saturday um, was absolutely awesome. Tiger shot the year we went. Tiger shot 67 on Friday to jump up into. I want to say it was like third and. The badge for Saturday, so you you know you have a, a badge to get you into the tournament, uh, triple the value to get in on Saturday after Tiger shot can you, 67. Can you scalp them? Um, you can. I think it's rather frowned upon, of course, and I think they have over the years tried to get pretty deep into the weeds of like, all right, let's find out where these badges originally came from and see who was going on the secondary market and more. Um, but yeah, luckily we had a connection through my brother that was able to get us access. And now... It was great. When you went, I mean, I've I've been to, was it a PGA or senior PGA event that was at Crooked Stick? My dad and I went. Um, They've had both. Probably 10 years ago, and it was cool. You just kind of walk from, was it, it, I mean, I would imagine the Masters, though, you'd like, you'd want to tiptoe around. Like, it's it's just a different feel. Is that, and how, how, how crowded was it? Like, how, because, you know, where did you stay? Yeah, so we stayed um, in a. It was a. I'm trying to think. 2011 would have been a hotel. 2019, we did stay in a house, probably like 15, 20 minutes out. And the prices are, you know, rather ridiculous um, for Augusta. And, you know, from a hospitality standpoint, where you're going to stay. And then obviously the tickets are super expensive as well. But, you know, when you get inside the gates, you know, I, I, I do think it's very important to be like as efficient as possible of you can place your chairs and leave the chairs and they will still be there when you return. It's a very kind of, they honor the, hey, if you have put your seat here, just because you're not in it right now, no one's going to sit in those chairs. Right. You know, you are, um, you're renting these chairs. So my brother looked, you know, very heavily into this process and we, you know, walked very aggressively to the 12th hole, the iconic par three. We put our chairs in kind of the second row there, um, you'll see this shot all week long. Uh, players leaving the 11th green, walking up to the 12th tee. Tons of you know patrons is what they call it um, up there. So we're in the second row. We place our chairs there at like 8 a.m., 7 a.m., whenever the gates open. And then we left them there, Jake, and we didn't come back until like 12 in the afternoon, 1 in the afternoon. We walked the course. We went to the range. We did the whole gift shop thing, which, again, insane prices. Um but we you did can, all of that. But, but you then, can get an egg salad sandwich for a buck, right? Well, I mean, the prices to get in, I, I, I would hope that, honestly, food should probably come with how much it costs to get. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say it was a graduation present for myself. It was a retirement gift for my dad. I want to say it was $800 for one day back in 2011. Wow. And that was like face value. And again, triple the value for Saturday after Tiger shot 67. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty amazing. I have a friend who's... Um, who lived in Augusta, Georgia, and for only a few years. But he he said that there are people that live in Augusta that 
basically pay their mortgage for like six months yeah. by renting out their house to players, right? Because it's not, how far is it from Atlanta? A two, two ish. Yeah. Because so we left Saturday night, drove to Atlanta. Took an early flight out from Atlanta Sunday morning, and we were able to watch the final round here in Indy, and it was a great final round the year that we went. Um, but again, it's a very unique tournament. You know, I was saying to people earlier, like download the Masters app, go to Masters.com. The viewing experience is tremendous. If you're trying to watch on TV, the only time slots really are like three to seven, so you you really want to watch on the app or online. And you know, when you watch the tournament, I've referenced this before. I feel like Augusta is similar to Lambeau. You ever been to Lambeau? Yes. Lambeau is very minimal corporate signage. Very minimal. Um, you're not going to see any corporate signage anywhere at Augusta National. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I was reading something earlier in the week, they have six sponsors, the, the entire tournament. The sponsors, it's not necessarily paying money for like Augusta National. It's purely to pay the production costs for ESPN and CBS to put on the Masters. A um, little bit of hospitality expenses for some VIP guests, but it is not like Augusta National is raking in a bunch of broadcast money. They're certainly making in a ton of money from you know merchandise and tickets and all of that. But when we watch this weekend, literally every hour, four minutes of commercials, which is unheard of. Right. Unheard of. Um, but that is what they are able to do, considering they are able to control so much of their product and how they put it on. Now, when you were in the gift shop at the Masters, this is a really dumb question. I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask anyway. Do they sell any merchandising for individual golfers? Or is it strictly no, I, Augusta no. National yeah. stuff? Yeah, I, you're not getting like... Danica, a Dustin Johnson Danica hat or t-shirts right. like you would, you know, outside IMS. Right. But you know, if you want to, John Daly is at the Hooters just outside of the front gates. You can stop there. <laughs> a thirteen and a half under par. That's our over under. Uh, the low score of the week. The over under there is at sixty four and a half. The high score of the week is eighty five and a half. For those curious, and uh, Tiger Woods is over under is forty second place out of eighty eight golfers. Do you believe that Augusta National is the most challenging course in golf? Um, not necessarily. No. No. But I think what makes the tournament so spe- special, Jake, is it does come back on a year in year out basis. So for a fan, you recognize a whole lot of the holes. You right. can make references to historic shots on those holes. Obviously, the course has changed, and with how technology is and the lengthening of holes it's probably been necessary that's a big debate right now um there but i think you as a sports fan and such an aficionado for history and tradition i do think you would find it enjoyable oh i mean i it's i have always felt kevin like in my and this is where so let me give you the list in my childhood of the sporting events that I felt like were transcendent to the point where even if you they were major sporting events on the calendar, where even if you were not a fan of that sport, you watched the finals, okay? And those would be, and I'm going with, again, when I was you know middle school, early high school, the Indy 500, in no particular order here, the Kentucky Derby, the Masters, Wimbledon, and I'm trying to think if there's any I'm missing. I mean, obviously, you had the big three, right? Wimbledon's a good one. And that's one that has, in my opinion, completely fallen off. Like, who won Wimbledon last year? I mean, I can tell you, like, in 87, it's like, oh, yeah, Pat Cash and Boris Becker and like Ivan Lundell. Djokovic is probably a 50-50 guess. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? You but don't like, think it's fallen off? I mean, I thought Djokovic, Federer, and Nadal had a pretty stranglehold on it for multiple decades. No, I, yes, I think it's fallen off. In the And, and listen, I, I get that, like, Serena, I mean, they were great. But it was – it's just different now, Kevin, because there are so many sports options. I mean, I have always said that sports – television sports viewing – it is exactly like when you had lunch in elementary school versus middle school. When you were in elementary school and you went to lunch, they gave you a tray that had like 
a hot serving Salisbury a, steak. Yeah, a peanut butter square, and you know what? And you you had to eat what they what they gave you. You didn't have a choice. You had lunch every day. Same. Everybody ate the same thing. Then you got to middle school, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever. I, my lunch consisted of like French fries and a honey bun and a fruit punch, or you could go with the tenderloin or the hot dog or whatever. Right? It was all. You you finally got to be able to choose for yourself. Television sports viewing in the 80s and probably into to an extent the early 90s was elementary school lunch. You basically g- watched what they gave you on the network of this is a big deal, Wimbledon on CBS, so you're going to watch it. This is a big deal, the Indianapolis 500 on Wide World of Sports, so you're going to watch it. This is a big deal, the Masters on CBS that was teased during the NCAA tournament, so you're going to watch it. Then you got into the era of the cable television and now, of course, streaming and everything else, and there are so many options that everybody is living in middle school lunch where they can just pick specifically the one thing that they want to ingest, and that's it, and not have to necessarily branch out to things that the network tells them is important. Yeah, I get what you're saying, but I mean, those options are not all the Wimbledon title between a Djokovic and a Federer. Right, but what I'm saying is the, the buildup to, like, again, I mean, in 1986, the Wimbledon, it was like three straight weeks, you know, the quarterfinals were the marquee event at four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon that, that everybody was watching. Now it's like, oh, I'll watch finals. But you knew, I mean, people followed it like they do the NCAA tournament now. It was just, it was it was huge. I was jotting down a few like bucket list sports events that I would love to attend at some point in my life. While while you were saying that, I got an SEC football game at night on there. Oh, you got it, yeah. I've got a World Series game. Yeah, I'd like to see a World Cup game between kind of two rabid international. Yeah, that fan would be bases. very cool. I'd love to see the hundred meter dash in an Olympics. That and, would be cool, and I'd love to see Wimbledon. Wimbledon would be very cool. Likely no question. Of any of those happening outside of SEC night game, probably slim. But I don't know. Isn't the World Cup here next for the men, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Here yep. next cycle? Yeah. You know what I think? Anything be- I'm missing on that list that you guys would jump out at you? Again, I've been fortunate to go to a Masters, fortunate to go to a Super Bowl. You know, Butler Duke national title was unreal. This is going to sound a little bit ridiculous because people are going to be like, of course, Corey goes with the auto racing thing. I think going to the Grand Prix of Monaco would be pretty unbelievable. Really? I think it's a. Well, and you could say it's about the Masters, but I think it's a little bit too stuffy. Ooh. And pot kettle black, certainly, I mean, with the Masters. I, I I get that. It might be stuffy in the paddock. I think, like, walking around the party atmospheres of it in the streets of Monaco, that's, you know what I mean? Okay. Like, I'm yeah. talking less the race and more the event, right? I used to think the Iditarod would be cool to see, but... Participating I'm, or uh, I mean, I'm such a dog lover now that I probably would worry about the dogs, so that would probably... Could bring boo. Bit. I like to go to just like a, a big time EPL game. Mm-hmm. Yes. I feel like that'd be pretty awesome. Well, you know, in watching Ted Lasso, a Derby maybe. Yeah. In watching Ted Lasso, which I think a lot of people are Kentucky Derby. I we we talked about it. You know, all three of us talked about it this morning before we went on the air. Watch I, yourself. I do think it would be super fun to just take a summer and live in like a little suburb of London. And pick a club, and be like those the peanut gallery bar folks in Ted Lasso, and just <laughs> watch the games and drink bass and and just enjoy. I mean, just they just make it look super fun, and it would be super cool. I think going to and I'm not a soccer fan, but I think going to a premier to your point, Mark, a Premier League match in England would be pretty awesome. You know, I was fortunate to go to the Colts game when they played at Wembley and just being in that stadium was unreal. Yeah. You know, NFL stadiums are not that big when you compare them to the grand standard of college football stadiums or even Wembley. Wembley would be on the top end right. of NFL stadiums. And so that's a newer that version venue, of Wembley, right? Correct. Being in that venue was um, absolutely unreal. We've got two golfers that have completed a hole at the Masters. I promise not to give hole-by-hole hole updates. One is Mike Weir, uh, Jake's Oh, he's the lead friend. singer of the elect. Yeah, they're yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more you can do, of course, with Michael Weir. And then Kevin Na, who is coming over from the Live Tour, Jake. Kevin Na is double bogeyed the first hole. Uh, that would be two over par. Mike Weir, 
the defending champ. I'm gonna uh, not defending champ, past champ. I'm gonna guess you like know that, three. Uh, he makes a par. That Kevin Na apparently is very very self assured. Have you heard that? Like when people ask him, I'm serious. He's very apparently he's very very confident. People ask him a lot. They're like, "Now, who are you exactly?" And, and you know, what what do you plan on doing here? And he just says, "No, nah, I'm good." In my opinion, that sucked. I mean, again, my finger was on the trigger right there. I was that, honestly waiting, the, Mark. But that wasn't bad. You knew there was another wasn't one coming, good. so you, had, you did a nice job waiting there to make sure that you got it. Uh, Shane says, "How about the F1 race in Vegas?" Yeah, but I mean, I, in a way, that's kind of like Monaco. To not, me, n- not the same, but, but it feels manufactured. Monaco's like that's fair. I mean, twenty-four hour Le Mans would be cool, right? That would be way up there. Um, that's a good question that you ask uh, of that. Yeah, we should save that for the summer. I mean, the Masters is definitely up there for sure. I mean, kudos to you for being able to go and, and do it. I mean, that's pretty cool. And I do think, like, and again, credit to my brother for this, you, you, you've got to do it right. Like, there is a process. You've got to be pretty efficient with your viewing experience there because – it's a massive venue, and you want to see everything. The crowds, obviously, are going to follow the likes of Tiger, Rory, et cetera, et cetera, like no other. So how you kind of go about viewing all of that, quite the process. Uh, Mark Dykton, your master's pick? Uh, I put my money where my mouth is. I put money on Rory McIlroy to don the green jacket. I am going to stay away from Rory, Scheffler, and Rom. not because my head says to do that, but I just want to go a little bit away from the three big ones. Yeah, I felt a little bad that I kind of went chalk. but Which, again, is fine. I I, you know, I said it to Jake earlier. Pato War, Joseph Newgarden, Scott Dixon right now, if you gave me those three for the Indy 500, I'd feel pretty good about myself. Yep. Uh, if health cooperates, I'm going to sneak in a Jason Day pick. Okay. Jason Day, and I'm just kind of waiting for this guy to break through. Um, the pride of Norway, Victor Hovland. Don't love his short game, but if it rains down there, I don't know if short game's going to be as big of a premium as it typically is. So a little bit off the radar. Um, not crazy off the radar, but Jason Day, Victor Hovland. By the way, Gordon Sargent, the 19-year-old from Vanderbilt right now. I got a little scratch on him as a top 20. Yeah, I sprinkled some money on Colin Morikawa as well. Mm, so this like that. this sergeant fella is he like the next? Sounds like he's the real deal. Won uh, won the NCAA's as a freshman. So he's Jordan Spieth. Uh, yeah, it's a Jordan Spieth type resume. Hits the ball a country mile. Not a big dude. Um, What's his hometown? I want to say he's an Alabama native that went to Vandy or okay. goes to Vandy, I should say. Now. Are you going to make a sergeant joke? I'm just no. waiting for it. How about Will? Is it Zalatoris? Yeah. Him and Cameron Young, you, your guy, were college teammates. So I'm going, can I replay, Can I take one out and put him in there? Whoa. Has your guy teed off and he's two under after two and, that, and that's where you're no. thinking right now? No. Is, is that the case? <laughs> no. Uh, so uh, give me yours again. Burns, Matsuyama, and Cameron Young. I'm going to take out that Burns fella. What's his first name? <laughs> you don't like Samuel? I thought you were riding the Kim Mulkey... LSU pride there. Sam Burns and LSU product. Okay. Um, Matsuyama's won it, right? He has, yes. Yeah, he's not going to do it again. So take Matsuyama out for me and put in this Zalatoris fella. Okay. A bit of a bulky putter at times, Jake. That's okay. I like bulky putters. Uh, speaking of bulky, um, check out what is on Louis Oosthuizen's left elbow. It looks like J.J. Watt and Barry Bonds have sent him something. Well, that's not advantageous in the golf game, right? No. And, you know, he's on the Live Tour, which you're not playing as much over in Live. So. Now, Kevin, you're an avid golfer. I'd like to ask you this follow, this golf question that I've always wondered. Have you ever, and maybe the answer to this is going to be, Jake, where have you been? In your golf travels, you played golf. You were a state champion golfer. You did not play in college, right? Correct. Did you have a chance to? Uh, nowhere of, of no. I mean, like, could you have played like a Hanover or sure. something like that? Sure. Okay. Um, Are you, you in Hanover because of Michael Shrewsbury? That's right. You avidly follow golf, obviously. Have you ever known, seen, or heard of anybody using a set of golf clubs known as pen seekers? <laughs> Sounds like the brand they have at Top Golf. Is uh, that I a no? Not, no, Mark. Have you? No. Is there anybody out there listening? I know JMV is is the probably the only one. He's the only one that I've ever had this conversation with. 
Does anybody out there know? JMB does, was kind of on a golf kick, wasn't does he? Does it like he jog the, the memory game? of anybody when they're like pen seekers? I know exactly where I've heard of those. Was this Caddyshack golf clubs? Close. I don't know much about golf from my childhood, but I know pen seekers. And I and literally, does has anybody ever played with pen seekers? Now you know our nine o'clock guest has played Augusta National. Correct. They do. Don't they allow like so many media people to play yeah, per year? Or something? a lottery through the media. Is that key for the one time he covered to go, the Masters? He got to play. How what about the, that? What are the odds in that lottery? We'll have to ask him that. What I, would I, I shoot I, if I played it? I, I've never golfed in my life. What would I shoot? Uh, you'd shoot two hundred. Yeah, two eighty. Three thirteen. <laughs> we'd we'd need a good local caddy for you. We need yeah. a good local caddy for you. Um, morning checkdown time. Scott Agnes in five. The morning checkdown. Omaha, 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 Omaha. Omaha. On 93.5 and 107.5, the fan. All right. Uh, NBA last night, I guess. Let's start with the Pacers. Uh, the Knicks did not have their top three scores, yet they had three different dudes score over 30. Obi Toppin, Manuel Quickly, and Quentin Grimes. The Pacers, for, I would say, different stretches of the game, looked like they were going to actually win last night without Halliburton and Turner. They ended up losing, though, 138-129. Jake, they had 10 dudes score at least eight points. You think that's ever happened? Ten guys score at least eight? Probably. Ten and double figures would be something, right? They were close. Brissett at eight. Gabe York had nine. Gabe York, man, that was a big miss for Notre Dame back in the recruiting days. I like Brissett. I'm Gosh, curious. Mather had a million turnovers. Curious to see if O'Shea Brissett is back next year. He's a contract, agent, right? Yeah, contract year for him. Uh, so, the Pacers right now again a jumbled tank standings with two games to go. Home to the Pistons. That's the finale uh, inside of Gamebridge Fieldhouse this year. That will be tomorrow night, and then at the Knicks on Sunday. Uh, Kevin from Marion, who's 54 years old, said he has played with pen seekers. Pen seekers were the golf clubs, by the way, that were always, always, always giving away on the prices right. <laughs> they would always be like, you know. Do you know Shane Steichen was on the prices clubs. right? Really? I know. I'm like, could, that would have been nice to know that when we chatted with him. You know, Sam, uh, Sam Schmidt, the. Racing Sam Schmidt? Yes. He first he bought his first race car with money that he had won on Press Your Luck. <laughs> When he was a student at Pepperdine. True story. That's a hell of a story. Uh, Cubs and Reds yesterday were rained out. As a matter of fact, they're already postponed. The Reds are again in Philadelphia today due to inclement weather. So that will be played tomorrow on Friday between the Reds and the Phils. Yesterday, Major League Baseball, Braves over the cards, 5-2. It was the Brewers over the Mets, 7-6. White Sox over the Giants by a final of 7-3. Cleveland got the best of Kevin's. Oakland Athletics six to four. That Cubs Reds game not getting made up until September. Saw that it's September first, right? Well, yeah. the Cubs don't come to Great American until then. Yeah. Um, Masters, we've got three guys that have completed a hole. Mike Weir made a par. VJ Singh made a bogey. Kevin Na made a double. Nah, I'm good. <laughs> I saw Sandy Lyle on the practice. Course. I did see I got very the excited. He didn't have suspenders, suspenders on no. him. Mark, is Mike Weir a lefty, Jake? Uh, the musician Mike Weir, correct. This Mike Weir is a lefty. No, no, Mike Weir's a, I believe, I don't think he's a southpaw. Scott Stallings he's about. He's a musician. He plays instruments with both hands. Scott Stallings about to tee off. Uh, do you remember the story we had a few months ago when they sent the Masters invite to a different Scott Stallings in the mail? <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> Wasn't he like, and the guy like had fun with it, right? I guess they're, oh yeah, uh, yeah, Scott did. Uh, and they ended up giving him tickets, by the way, the other Scott Stallings to the, to the Masters. Uh, I guess there's like a predictor. Of you know what everyone's going to shoot in round one, they have Scott Stallings as the highest score in round one, somewhere in the eighties. And people were asking if the predictor thought the other Scott Stallings. <laughs> they thought he was Scott Stallings. Scott Stallings that works at a Lowe's in German <laughs> Church, Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, all right, Scott Agnes. He joins us next here. Kevin and Query on an overcast, a little bit of a chillier Thursday than we had yesterday. Drown.
105.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Scott Agnes joining us now. Fieldhouse Files. Scott, your master's pick is who? Hey, good morning. Yeah, happy master's. Uh, I hate to join the bandwagon, but I've heard Jim Nance and Will Haskett both say Rory, so I'm going to roll, roll, roll with that here. Seems to be the popular one. Is that more of heart or head? I think it's more more head and numbers and, and just kind of current trends. Yeah, and certainly if it rains, Rory on a soft golf course is one that um, is a pretty safe pick. Um, all right, it's got two to go for the Pacers. They are certainly tanking. There are, you know, I said to Jake earlier in the show, when your best player appears on the television broadcast, that's when you know that you're tanking, and that's what Tyrese Halliburton did last night. Um, you look at their first-round picks, three of them, Boston, Cleveland as well. There's no way they spend all three of those first round picks, right? You got to expect them to package something, don't, don't you think? Yeah, that's the the expectation right now. Um, also, if you throw in what we hope could be one of the top two picks in the second round, which might be even more valuable than that that last pick, especially with Boston, which is you know twenty eight, twenty nine, whatever. Uh, that gets really interesting for high picks right there, but they don't have the roster spots, the playing time, or the focus, uh, enough focus there on development to to bring in three or four different new guys right there. So I, I, I think they absolutely uh, keep that first one, and then things get interesting because you, you package those together, you include maybe a current player. I don't know. It just depends how much you like a guy and what exactly you want to do to maybe move up and get a, a better pick. Or, or kind of defer it. But I will say this: the, the front office and scouts uh, for the Pacers really like this draft, and, and they've said that kind of from the not just like one to three or one to five, but the first round especially. Whereas the general consensus is next year not very interesting. So it's not like you'd want to defer it one year. Scott, to me, the thing that's curious about Indiana having you know, the three picks in the top 35 order, if they hold on to them, is this isn't necessarily a roster that has, like, a huge number of players that you question how you're going to maneuver them around to create space. In other words, if I'm not mistaken, these are the players whose contracts would be up at the end of the year. George Hill, O'Shea Brissett, James Johnson, Gabe York, Kendall Brown. Uh, that makes it pretty easy to free up some roster spots. Brissett would be the only one you give a look at. We talked about it with Denary yesterday. I like O'Shea Brissett. I like what he brings to the table. He's not – obviously, he's very inexpensive. But is there going to be roster room for him next year? Yeah, so he, he's been playing a lot of the, that four, right? And that's one of their biggest areas of need. Now, going into the off season, you, you hope they address that. And so it just kind of depends where does he then fall on the depth chart? Because right now it's him and Jordan Mora, um, which kind of speaks to the need to upgrade at that spot with, with more of a, a, a true power forward. But I, I wouldn't rule him out. Um, the other thing I would throw in there is I think, I believe you keep one of George Hill and James Johnson and I'd lean George Hill. Um, he can play more. And he has made it absolutely clear he wants to be with this franchise, hopefully playing for at least another year or two, and then he hopes to be on that in in some kind of different capacity. But um, that speaks to the problem, though, because, yeah, you're going to have to create some roster spots. And and I also think you'll probably see a player or two dealt. It just makes too much sense to try to get some clarity in both the front court and the back court. And Scott Agnes with us here from Fieldhouse Files on the Payless Slickers Hotline. Scott, again, the Pacers have you know pretty much said, all right, Tyrese Halliburton, Miles Turner, you're not playing the rest of this season. Um, I'm curious, like player incentive wise, if there are incentives like individually for points or assists or playing time, would like, Halliburton and Turner get that? No, no, you can't just kind of say, hey, we got a friendly owner, we'll take care of you. Because then then it would very much, for players, then depend on the situation. Basically, you can't make exceptions here. So So if you're um, Halliburton, wouldn't you want to play? Well, I will say in terms of bonuses or things like that, uh, I I am not aware of either one of those guys having anything that directly affects them. Keep in mind, Tyrese still on his rookie deal, 
So usually those types of things, I'm not even sure you have those, but those seem very limited and on a rookie deal. That will come with the next deal that could be negotiated this summer. And then with Miles Turner does have them, uh, it does have bonuses. I believe uh, his is Defensive Player of the Year, and then a, di- a separate one is being one of the uh, on an All NBA team. And so that doesn't really directly impact him, I think, by missing you know these final couple of weeks either. But that would be something to keep in mind for sure if you're a player, because um, you know what you what you're seeing throughout the league right now is you know guys getting. Uh, specific bonuses that they negotiate, whether it's minutes played, games played, things like that. Scott, I want you to envision, I'll say three years from now. So we're we're sitting here, it's the 2026 season, the Indy 500's upcoming, and the Pacers are in the Eastern Conference Finals. You think and Tiger's they're... playing in the Masters or not? Excuse me? You think Tiger's yeah. playing in the Masters or not? We're we're tuned in to watch Tiger as the color commentator on Masters uh, coverage. No, Boo. I hate this Come hypothetical. On. So in this hypothetical, the Pacers are in the Eastern Conference Finals, right? And I think we know that Tyrese Halliburton is probably that like the the straw that's mixing the drink for them. Is Benedict Matherin? their number two or even like their number one scoring guy that Halliburton's going to? Or do we now that Waters found its level a little bit see it as they still need one more piece and Matherin would be there'd be in other words are they at their best if he's their if he is their lead scoring guy or do they need another piece that makes him like a two to three option? Yeah, yeah. My first reaction to this hypothetical, which I agree, I don't like what that Tiger mentioned, but uh, mm-hmm. I think they're probably that one player away still, um, and and I think that's the hope potentially with this draft pick is then you give that player two years to develop and then there you are and you could be right there you're definitely in the playoff conversation but you're 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 winning a series or two something they have not done since 2014 so um i think you're you're hoping out of this next draft is to get one of those pillars you got halliburton you got matherin to be sure nimhart's kind of getting into that conversation um but i think you know, he's not. He won't be one of those top top guys. I think that next top guy you're getting out of this draft. And Scott Agnes with us here from Fieldhouse Files. Scott, I guess let's get that time frame just to this time next year. Uh, should we be talking about the Pacers as a team in the lottery again, a team in the play-in, or a team as a top six seed? I believe it'll be a team in the playoffs, and that absolutely should be the conversation. I, I've. I've liked what they've done over the last couple of years. It's not been pretty to watch. I had someone text me yesterday, hey, look, like we saw the, the Pacers were the model of consistency. Uh, you know, we're always made the playoffs. You know, what, what are we watching over these last couple of years? I question it. And I'm like, hey, look, this is all part of the plan. It's not fun, but this is the necessary reality in, in sports and in professional sports. You, the key thing they always tried to do was rebuild on the fly. That was the word Donnie Walsh always used to talk about. And so I think Herb Simon, he, he saw that and said, well, if Donnie can do it, you can do it. Well, I think dynamics have changed a lot. And so they've set in and, and had these two rebuilding years. It hadn't been pleasant. It's this year certainly better than expected. Uh, but now moving forward, I, I think you kind of remove, a, a, again, a couple more of the excuses and say, all right, next year you're back in the playoffs. Scott, your um, your latest piece is on a big-time hobby for uh, Tyrese Halliburton that he went to Bloomington, correct, to kind of tap into a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, that was fun. That was in early February. And, in fact, it, KB, it was the day before – he was crowned an all-star and, and that special night. And so, uh, and also that would have been his return from injury and such. So he went down to Bloomington and the fans don't know off the court, the two big things that Tyrese Halliburton really enjoy are fashion and gaming. Like he has a gaming studio. will often go live uh, for you. People can join in and watch him play. I, I, not into that, but uh, anyway, on this night, he was invited down to Bloomington to serve on a panel to speak about fashion with other uh, with students who are fashion designers. So there were no pacer questions or, you know, what's it going to be like playing against LeBron, who he idolizes, you know, that next day or, or anything like that. It was what has inspired, you know, what you wear and what brands and what 
do you wear a brand if they're in controversy? Stuff like that. So it was a, it was a real deep dive on Tyrese off the court, his love for fashion. And, and then last night, uh, he, he wore an outfit that was designed by one of the students that he worked with over the last couple of months. So that was really a cool cul- culmination of that whole experience for him. So I will take out, obviously, the critique of I didn't see his, fas- his outfit last night. Um, I have always felt with fashion that – Oftentimes, the more famous that you are outside of the fashion world, the more leeway you get with your fashion. Uh, I've seen Tyrese Halliburton a couple of times wearing outfits where he looks like Charlie Chaplin. And I'm like, if you weren't an NBA player, there's no way that you could pull off wearing like patent leather clogs with jeans that are two inches too short and eight inches too wide in the thighs. Am I being too critical here, Scott? Well, the big thing he likes are Doc Martens and Prada loafers. Whereas I think so much anymore, so much of, I would say, us, like general style, uh, at least my friend, a lot of it's just kind of jeans and sneakers has become the big thing. And and Tyrese said he used to do that. He used to uh, wear a lot. He has a huge vintage T-shirt collection, has a lot of WWE, for example. But I I think you get the leeway to your point. uh, And also you have more options because you have so many brands that are reaching out wanting you to wear stuff and in large part that's why that quote-unquote one runway guys walking in we're all familiar with that with the playoffs. oh yeah it's become a daily or a game thing like and, and by the way like in houston there's a literal red carpet that is set out uh to kind of make this a bigger moment so in large part i mean these guys are getting hooked up with brands and so that's why a lot of times they're posting on Instagram about it because then it's kind of going full circle. They tag them, and, and so they have the flexibility to get a bit, little bit more wild. Um, Houston's red I carpets, like I, I, I Scott, I was going to say around, Houston's like Houston's coach. red carpet. They got seventeen wins. You know what I mean? But the red carpet looks good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's another way of playing toward playing into the culture, and also playing into whatever your players enjoy. Let's go all in, embrace it, and be one of those you know supportive-type franchises. So now every team has a camera and a video person uh, basically you know, outside in the team bus or where guys walk in to capture those moments. That's become part of the nightly r- routine, I think. Scott, when you, know, you say a player loves video games and fashion. If this was Paul George or Victor Oladipo, people would be rioting. So wh- why don't people freak out about Tyrese Halliburton's off-the-court interest? I think for one, because he's also locked into NBA league pass every game. Like he even touched on yesterday during, uh, you know, as you mentioned, he joined the the broadcast for the first quarter, noting how he'll be watching every single game in the postseason, things like that. And I think the one thing fans maybe aren't aware of is just how much free time oftentimes these guys have. So for example, they don't have practice. So I'm sure most of the guys will be in at certain times getting a lift in or maybe getting some shots up and stuff like that, but then they have all day to themselves. So you you got to fill it. So you want to find something, a thing or two, to be invested in and and fill that time. Now, with the gaming thing, Kevin, and I say this half seriously and half kidding. Because I was big with DeAndre Ayton, remember? That that, that debate in the offseason about it? I think that people here – The problem is with Paul George and Victor Oladipo is that their interests seemingly made them feel like they outgrew Indianapolis. And gaming you can do from anywhere. And that's now the fashion is is probably worth keeping an eye on. Scott, I I know that sounds crazy, Scott. And somebody got on me um, earlier, like, oh, you know, you're you're talking about Halliburton, whether or not he's going to outgrow Indianapolis. And uh, and I'm like, well, listen, the reality is when it's happened to your last two franchise players where they felt like they were too big to be here, then you're naturally going to have like a PTSD fear of that, right? Yeah, that's the reality, I think, for fans because of how they've been impacted here by the last four or five years. Basically feeling like, okay, uh, yeah, I think you put it well of, you know, player outgrew this situation, that type of thing. There's more that's gone into it, but that's, that's actually a really good, simple explanation to that. But I I don't have that fear. I haven't got any feeling like that with Tyrese here early. Um, and, and to this point, again, he's a little bit different. He's a Midwest kid, and he's got his mom. She moved here. Like you got a lot of different factors where I don't expect that to come into play, but you should never say never. 
Yeah, again, I, I want to make it pretty clear. I don't have any worry about it. It's just kind of funny how, you know, with certain players, we, we you know, make a bigger deal about it. Both Halliburton, that just doesn't seem to be the case so far. Paul George, by the way, was the perfect example of showing that because I think with Paul, a lot of it was getting eyes, getting attention, getting endorsement deals. Paul was the perfect example of you going, you being able to play in any NBA market and getting that. Remember, he had that a marquee deal with Nike. They were working on a signature shoot right before his injury. National deals with AT and T, Papa John's, on the cover of NBA 2K. Like, I think that would have been a reasonable excuse if he didn't get all that. He did, which also show there was a lot that really went into um, him wanting out. Scott, the most commercial – this is what I'd love to say to every NBA player or, or in NFL, whatever it might be. And I am an unapologetic homer for the city of Indianapolis, okay? Mm-hmm. The most commercialized athlete in American sports of the last 20 years was the quarterback of the Indianapolis Colts. You, you, yeah. you couldn't you couldn't watch Amazing Race and not see Peyton Manning three times during commercial breaks, and he was the quarterback of the Indianapolis Colts. I mean, if if, if you're a star, you can play. They're going to be able to. I, I thought I've said it before. I'll say it again. With Paul George, the beginning of the end was when he went on Jimmy Kimmel and he looked like an absolute clown, dressed like he was in the middle of the Michael Jackson "Beat It" video. But it was, you know, 2011, not or whatever it was, two, 2015, not 1983. And he's like, yeah, you know, my fashion consultant. I'm like, here we go. It's over. But isn't Halliburton well, saying that right now? I Understood. I mean, that's that's where the PTSD comes from, for sure. Well, let, let me add to there, by the way. Paul George, one of the, the consultant, fashion consultant he was referencing, was his sister. Right. So it wasn't like this big hot shot or someone out in L.A. But I, I do totally understand and agree with that. That felt a little big time, a little different. And then you had the wink, or not the wink yet, I guess, with Magic Johnson. But Jimmy Kimmel, I believe that was the scenario where they talked about, do you want to change your name to PG-13? And then what did he do like three years later? So, yeah. I, I totally understand and respect fans for feeling that way, but I see no reason for concern with Tyrese. Let me put it that way. Scott Agnes, latest on fashion, and he's got Rory McIlroy donning the green jacket coming up on Sunday afternoon. Scott, thank you for all of our conversations throughout the season. Great stuff, man, and we'll certainly keep the conversations pretty frequent here in the offseason. Sounds good. I appreciate it, guys. Scott Agnes right there on the Payless Liquors hotline. Your leader right now in Augusta National is a 29-year-old optometrist from Ireland. Oh, really? The beautiful things about the Masters. Yeah, let's you take a look a at your eyes. Half dozen amateurs in the field. Let, let, let's take a look at your retina. Matthew McLean, <laughs> one under par through yeah, two. Ma- Dr. McLean, yes. Um, see what we've done now, Kevin? Just had to mention he's an optometrist <laughs> and we've lost Jake. From Ireland. I think it's a pretty cool story. Don't know about who the makes stain power atop the leaderboard. Who makes but. the green jacket? Like it's there's got to be some licensing deal, right? I don't know, man. Augusta's weird. I could see them being like, "Yeah, we got this member," and he. Just, you think they get it from the? That's, the that's his only job. Sears and Valdosta. <laughs> if you had the green jacket, how often would you wear it? Scotty Sheffer said earlier this week that he had it on a commercial flight earlier this year. Come on. Yeah. I think there were pictures the day after Hideki Matsuyama won that he was going back to Japan, so flying out of Hartsfield to get back to the homeland, and uh, yeah, he just had it with him. Kevin, you just missed the opportunity of a lifetime, buddy. You just Where did you just vacation? We just vacationed in, well, I guess Cincinnati, if you want to be technical. Since 1967, Hamilton Taylor and Company of Cincinnati has been the exclusive maker of the green jacket. Wow. But don't even think about trying to order one for yourself. Hamilton Tailoring does not accept orders from the general public for such an iconic article of clothing. The color of jackets known as Master's Green is actually a shade of brilliant rye green known as Pantone 342. How much do you think they pay for that? Augusta. Uh, oh, it says right here, 52 bucks per jacket. No, I'm just kidding. A man that's playing against the Nationals, Zach Kiefer, in 10 minutes. And Micah Shrewsbury coming up at 9.30 here. Again, a little bit chillier, uh, an overcast start to this Thursday here in Indy. Kevin Aquari right here on 93.5, 107.5, The Fan.
Let me ask you this, Kev. Yeah. Which do you think would be the coolest to win and own as your own? A green jacket, a Rolex, if you were a winner of the Rolex 24. Green jacket, gold jacket. Who goes? Uh, a gold jacket as a Hall of Fame member of the National Football League. Or, I'm trying to think of other iconic, I guess, a, a World Series and or NBA championship ring. I mean, honestly, Jake, I think it'd be pretty cool to see your picture on the Borg Warner. Yeah, that's... That's a really unique way that is, to... I mean, that's because you know that... It's your freaking picture. Yeah. And I guess I mean, the Hall of Fame bust you know, has a similar similarity to it. You know, because it's, you know, golf, it's one of the four majors. So, yes, it's probably the one that players want to win the most. Um, maybe a little debate on depending where you're from in the world on that. Um, but I, you know, covering the NFL, maybe you just hear it more, Jake, but so many players talk about gold jacket, gold jacket, gold jacket. I he, mean, he, he, he's a gold jacket. It's very guy. unique, right? And, very and unique. And it is the ultimate, I mean, only. And I don't know, maybe the Edron James line is super relevant. Gold teeth to gold jacket. Yeah. The green jacket is also, though, I mean... It's always a very... I don't, awkward, I don't know where you ever wear it, but... It's kind of an awkward moment when they're in that cabin and they're putting on the green jacket. Oh, left hand, right hand. Oh, you know, well, it's a little... They must have, like, a... They must have a transferable, right, that is there just, like, a, a display one. And then whoever the winner is then gets custom made and like two months later gets. Do they do like a. Is Leon tailoring present down there? <laughs> right. I mean, well, as I said, it's. Uh, Hamilton, Ohio, right? Yeah. So is it like the Indy 500 where like a month later the winner returns to like unveil the fitting of his official jacket yeah, and that kind of thing? Officially. Yeah. Because I mean, obviously you could have winners that are the size of Ian Woosnam or the size of, you know. Mickelson or Ernie El. It is interesting that if you win multiple, you only get one jacket. Really? Did you did you mention that? Yeah. The green jacket is a, this is from the PGA website, a classic three-button, single-breasted, and single-vent suit featuring the Augusta National logo on the left chest pocket. The logo appears on the uh, also appears on the brass buttons. The tropical weight wool, two and a half yards per jacket, comes from the Forceman Company in Dublin, Georgia. The owner's name is stitched on the inside label of the jacket, and because of all the materials used, it takes roughly one month to make a single green jacket from start to finish. Mm. The estimated cost to make a green jacket is two hundred and fifty dollars. Wow! When you consider how much it costs to get multiple the gates, master winners receive only one jacket. Nick Faldo, who won the Masters in nineteen eighty nine, ninety, and ninety six, had his jacket produced by Nordstrom. So there Tiger Woods has one jacket for his five wins? Correct. Now, what if you put on some weight? Can you get I, it like I, adjusted? That's a very like, good I, That's question. the thing. Phil Mickelson, or lose you know, weight? maybe it's looked a little different, yeah. yeah. Now, somebody asked us the other day, too, which is a good one. What does Michael Phelps do with his silver medals? Oh, give those to his cousins. Probably in his fish tank or something like no. that. A coaster? Yeah. Literally. Oh, yeah, they're underneath a passenger seat <laughs> in my car. I uh, mean, how about this one? Over under the length of the winning final shot of the Masters. So the final, in all likelihood, putt to win the Masters. Over under feet. over under three feet. I go over. Over. Ooh, don't you think under? You got yeah, a 20 it footer is a, and you hit it close. Yeah, it's probably a it may just be a you guys going over. So that that's three a little, feet's not a ton. It's not that yeah, far. but if you you know if you hit it to twenty five feet on the last hole, you lag it up there close. I'm you still mark taking. It. I'll take. I'll take it over. Rory will hit like a five foot one. Do you guys remember last year? Scotty Scheffler looked like us at a putt putt course trying to putt out on the last hole. Oh yeah. There were some people. I think McAfee honestly was one of them that had a huge bet on him winning by X amount of shots. Was that and, featured on Full Swing too? Yeah, it was. Yeah, he was laughing about that. Um, all right, uh, Zach Keeper. He's played Augusta National. We'll talk, obviously, a lot of Colts with him. Coming up next, Micah How jealous Sh- are you? Do it again. How jealous are you that he played Augusta? Very jealous. Very jealous. Uh, Micah Shrewsbury, 930.
Jake, the Irish optometrist, Matthew McLean, the only person under par so far at Augusta National. We have 13 people on the golf course. In Indy 500 terms, would this be like... Ah, I need you to read the fourth line there. Would this be Milka Duno leading after one lap? A-R-F and then what is the fourth letter? Oh my God. Which is clearer, A or B? <laughs> You notice you're the only one laughing. <laughs> That's fine. The, Kev, I, do you the, have any of your the, beer left? The, I, there yeah, are, I just went to the fridge. There are people in their cars now saying, yes, Irish optometrist. That's exactly. Had, I can get you a pair of glasses and also a bar of soap that smells like a spring. When is that, Kiefer? <laughs> I mean, we're at Micah Shrewsbury on at 930, and this is how you're acting. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a Hold on. You... you you the guy that took your shirt off and ate donuts because they hired Michael Shrewsbury. Correct, huh? And you're worried about the fact that I'm going to speak like an Irishman because he's now the coach of the Notre Dame Irish. Right, uh-huh. Is it, is it the team optometrist that's leading the Masters? <laughs> is that our, our three point shooting is going to be right yeah. on par? Uh, Notre Dame football is playing in Dublin, by the way, this year. Oh, against, well, against you Navy don't say. The ah, back there in the old country, yes. I'm <laughs> just. Do you know. <laughs> We're moving on. <laughs> Excuse me? Excuse me? It, if this guy shoots a record, if he shoots a record for lowest master score ever, in, in which book will his record be documented? Do you know, Mark? I'm afraid to no. ask. And the Guinness. Let's go ahead and have a couple of hours in there. In my opinion, that sucks. <laughs> no. I'm not kidding. I'll take an. I'll take any sort of alcohol right now. <laughs> I, I, I don't I, know what I, you're I talking about. Just Jameson straight <laughs> at this point right now. I take Everclear. <laughs> I, Kevin Na, three over through five. That is the high score so far. Uh, Kevin Na, a member of Live Golf. Sandy Lyle, Mark, uh, bogeyed the first. Well, I mean, he's just getting ready to gear up. He's got to get the suspenders on. He's more of a back nine guy, right? Yeah, of course. How old is Sandy Lyle? Sandy Lyle is 66. What's his hometown? No idea if he's 66. He's Scotland, right? This is the country. Oh, wow, 65. Oh my gosh, this is this is incredible. Guess where Micah Shrewsbury? Guess where Sandy Lyle's from? I just gave it away. Guess where he's from? Mm-hmm. You said Scotland, right? He is from Shrewsbury, United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> really? Is this real life right now? <laughs> Do wow. I have to take off my shirt now? Do you know the most common stone found underneath the earth and you know, I'm taking geology right now. In Shrewsbury, United Kingdom, do you know what is the most precious mineral and stone that's found in the earth there? Mica. Uh, yeah, mica is correct, yes. <laughs> what? Micah Shrewsbury at 930. Mark is staring at the floor. Why, are, gonna join why us? are you staring at the floor? I'm, just, just I, I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> Flabbergasted. <laughs> It's the nine o'clock hour. You heard I the know. promo leading into just, this. This break. is when we hit our stride. This is, and this is right when I wake up. This, couldn't disagree more. Have you slept today? Are you sleep deprived? Well, I've, I've got a roommate that likes to get me up at four now. Just doing well-being checks on you. <laughs> do you, do you do your voice impressions for Boo? What's that? Do you do your like impressions for Boo? Like your voice? I, I, I do talk to Boo a lot. But in voices, like you do your Irish guy later. I have a I have an animal voice. Doesn't everybody I've always said there are three kinds of people in the world that you can't trust. Okay? Three people in the world that you cannot trust. You can't trust people that don't know how to deboard an airplane in proper order. Uh, like that jackass in Rue twenty eight that jumps up and you know, yep. come on, dude. That's number one. You can't trust anybody that doesn't return their grocery cart in the parking lot. True. And you can't trust anybody that when they meet a dog or cat does not have a dog or cat voice. Right now, yeah. does that go with young children as well? Like you have yeah, a little I think bit so. of a baby voice under under the age of two, probably. Yeah, sure. It's a problem if you're still talking to them like that at fourteen. Nice to meet but... you, Rosie Bowen. How are you this morning? How was your day? Yeah, I mean, do you do you have pets, Mark? We did. Have... No, we don't anymore. When you did, mm-hmm. what did you have? Dog or cat? Dog. What was the dog's name? Parker. When you would talk to Parker, did you just say like, "Hi, Parker"? Would no. you like to eat? Hey, buddy. What's up? What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what you got right? there? I mean, that's, exactly. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, we had Rudy with an I growing up. It was a female. R-U-D-I. And that was a dog or a cat? A uh, black lab dog. And again, when you would talk to Rudy, did you just sure. say like, hi, Rudy? Ha- go ahead. Hello, Rudy. Good afternoon. No, that's nice not what you did. You. I want to hear how you did it. Rudy girl. How yes. are you? <laughs> yeah, see? Hey, boo-boo. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm like, I'm literally walking around my house like Yogi Bear. I was going to say, I feel like I'm walking He's actually, right now. Boo has kind of become, Boo, Boo, Shannon calls him Booski. So he's kind of become Booski, truth be told. It's a nice little nickname there. Yeah. <laughs> a nickname of when your when your name's Boo, you need a nickname, <laughs> as if as if Boo needs a nickname. Mm-hmm. Yeah, isn't enough. Um, all right, let's head to the Payless Liquors Hotline. Saving us right now, Zach. We Kiefer. will certainly talk some Colts with Zach so. Kiefer, but my jealousy is through the roof every time him and I have this discussion. Zach, for our listening audience out there, please explain how you got to play Augusta National. A great question to start today's segment. I know, I know. Go ahead. Uh, well, the media lottery. I covered the event in 2019, and, and 32 lucky members of the media get to play the course the day after the tournament. And the the hook is, if you've played it, you're not eligible for the lottery for seven years. So that obviously thins the pool a little bit. We were scared, man. We were scared because if you remember in 2019, they moved up the tee times. Tiger was in the final group. And they teed off at like 9.30. So they told us the day before that if this gets pushed back to Monday, sorry, you're out of luck. And, and I'm not a golf writer, so I didn't know if I was ever going to get back. But it was a twofer. Tiger won. Everybody remembers how that tournament ended. And the next day, I played a pretty bad round on a pretty great course. So you said there are 32, right? Correct. How many total media members would you guess are credentialed for a Masters? Probably 200, 250. So how, how hard national media? How hard was that to get credentialed? I was with USA Today at the time. Uh, I don't think it's an easy credential to get, um, but you got to remember, like you know, people are coming from overseas. They're probably not bringing their clubs. They're, you can't exactly rent golf clubs from Augusta National. Uh, some people don't play golf, even though they cover it. And then a lot of people have played it in the last couple of years, so they're not eligible and. When I found out, I got immediately nervous, immediately. Like, I could feel it go through my whole body. And I think I was as nervous as I've ever been in my life standing on that first tee. And that includes the birth of my two daughters and my wedding day. I was more nervous for that first drive on the on Augusta's tee box. So, local caddy, you're you're playing the member tees, correct? So what, 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 and it's the same pins as they had on Sunday for the final round? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's completely different though. So all the grandstands are gone, and there's just nobody, and it's oh, almost like oh, you have oh, the place empty. They're still up, but they're yourself. empty. It, yeah, it, it's amazing. Uh, my caddy was a long drive um, golfer, so he he was laughing at my my 250 yard drive. Like he was like, "That's nothing." Um, he was telling great stories. He had caddied for Peyton Manning a couple weeks prior. Peyton was a new member of Augusta at that point. He had a bunch of stories about the pros coming out there and trying to putt from every different angle, but a completely surreal experience. I don't know if I'll ever top that in my golf career again. Uh, you've got a master's pick for us here? Yeah, I'm going Scotty Scheffler. I'd be stunned if he wasn't top five, but I feel like it's got to be one of the big three, right? It's got to be Rory or Rom or Scheffler, but yeah. I, just the way Scheffler's playing right now, I think he might be the first to go back-to-back since Tiger in 2001-2002. Gosh, it almost has the feel, Zach, if you said to me right now, Scotty Scheffler wins by three, I would probably just shrug my shoulders and say, yeah, probably 50% chance that happens, which is With crazy. With a four-putt on 18 again? Right, right, which is absolutely crazy. All right, Zach Kiefer with us from The Athletic. Um, Zach, I want to go back to the owners' meetings, and it seemed like there was the impression from Jim Irsay, if I'm not mistaken, where he told um, – the crew out there where you know there are five quarterbacks that we could draft did you hear that and would those five be the four we've talked about the most plus Hendon Hooker is that the impression that you're under yeah in in his very Jim Mercer way he sort of danced around each player without naming the player right he's talked about an undersized playmaker who's got all the right stuff in the big moments and, and that felt like Bryce Young he talked about a pocket passer who's very accurate that felt like C.J. Stroud. And then at the end of his description, he mentioned a guy who maybe isn't going to go in the top 10 and who's coming off an injury and might be a good value bet later in the draft. That's obviously got Hendon Hooker written all over it. I still don't think Hooker's the play. I really think they're going to take a quarterback at four or if they move up to three. I don't think they're going to try and force this. I feel like the injury plays a role into that. But, yeah, I think they're the, the one takeaway I had from Jim Mercer last week was 
this is going to be a Chris Ballard, Shane Steichen decision. And for all the, you know, stepping in and, and making decisions himself, which he did last fall, we've talked about that at length. It really feels like after the season, Jim Irsay took, took a step back. He wanted to let Chris Ballard run the coaching search, and he did. And he's going to let Chris Ballard and Shane Steichen pick this, co- pick this quarterback. And it really feels like unless there's something crazy unusual, and these are Jim Irsay's words, he's not going to step in and override. He's going to watch some tape. But again, and I think this has not been covered enough, we all talk about what Chris Ballard wants in the quarterback, and he's going to have the final say as the GM. But this is Steichen's quarterback. This is the team Steichen's going to build around for the next couple of years. His voice is really going to matter in these debates the next couple of weeks as well. You know, Zach, I had asked earlier this week, you know, your former colleague, Stephen Holder, who I know you're still friends with from ESPN, but I asked him this same question, so I'll ask you. Shane Steichen's interesting, Zach, because he's worked with quarterbacks of various skill sets. You know, a true pocket passer like a Phillip Rivers with a quick release, a guy with a cannon of an arm in Justin Herbert, obviously a guy you can you can run draw plays with in Jalen Hurts. In your opinion, Zach, or in your discussion or analysis of it, has Shane Steichen tipped his hand at all about, in your opinion, which style he most preferred working with? No, and he's really buttoned up, Jake. And it was funny last week. Monday morning, about 7.30, we talked to Shane Steichen at this breakfast table, right? And and as the day progressed, each of our three interviews revealed more about this team's thinking. We had Chris Ballard about noon, then we had Jim Irsay at a separate hotel about 7 o'clock. So with each successive interview, we learned more. Steichen didn't say anything. He said due diligence about five or six times, and, and he wouldn't give anything away. He did mention that running is not a requisite for him. He doesn't need a quarterback who can rely on his legs a lot. Now, every quarterback coming out in the draft right now can run. Just about every single one can run, especially these four. They're all athletic in their own way. But the one thing that jumps out about this conversation with Steichen that I've had with him in different parts of the last couple months is he wants a dog. Like, he wants he wants an MFer. Like, he wants a guy who is obsessed with football. And they had dinner, the three of them and their, and their wives, Ballard and Ursay and – um, Steichen on Monday night, and Steichen was talking about Jalen Hurts' ascension over the last 16 months in Philadelphia. And there was a point in that summer between, and if you remember, after Jalen's first season in a starter, they played that playoff game against the Bucks, and he was terrible. He was terrible, and they were routed by the Bucks. And there was a lot of conversation in Philly whether he was the long-term guy. And there was, you know, they had a pretty good pick last year because of the Carson Wentz trade in that first round, and there were some discussions if they go quarterback last year. Now, it wasn't a good quarterback class, but just to tell you where the Eagles were with Hurts that year to where they are now, he was second in MVP voting and an absolute baller last year. And there was a point in that summer when Steichen just said to himself, this guy's doing too many things right to fail right now. So he just saw something in Jalen that convinced him, and he told a story about working with, with Justin Herbert during the draft During a long interview, Herbert got every single question right except for one. And at the end of the interview, Herbert was visibly frustrated, and he said, man, I just hate the fact that I got that one question wrong. Here's the right answer. And so Steichen's looking for a guy that's like that, that's like him in a lot of ways. Like Steichen is, and I've talked to a lot of people around the league, like the one thing they say about him is he's just all ball. He's just all ball, and it's his life. And he wants a quarterback who thinks like that. So – you know, that's sort of the art of this scouting process. We can all debate what they can do on the field, what they can't. Everybody out there can watch the tape. What we can't do from this seat is sit in these interviews that are happening this week, and they should be done by the end of next week, these hours-long interviews and then workouts with these guys to see if, frankly, they're, they're for real or not. One of the questions Chris Ballard and his staff asked in the draft room a lot is, does this player love football or does this player love what football brings them? And, and that's sort of the murky part of this decision. But I think Steichen is going to push for the guy that's obsessed with football because Steichen believes he can coach up those physical qualities that all these guys have. So, Zach, I was mentioning earlier in the program this morning, Zach Kiefer's our guest on the Payless Sugars Hotline. I was mentioning that I'm doing – it's kind of fun. There's a radio station in Pennsylvania that does – 
probably for the top five picks, I would assume, a mock draft. And they have a representative of each market. So I'm obviously the fourth one on that is going to say who I think the Colts will select based on what three picks are taken in front of me. If I wanted to be smartest guy in the room or dumbest guy in the room and really throw a curveball and say a non-quarterback, who would be the most likely the Colts would take at that position? That's hard because if they don't take a quarterback, they're not moving up, which probably means Will Anderson's off the board, right? I think he's the most polished, safest defensive player, and I feel like that's a Chris Ballard pick, right? There's never enough defensive linemen. I don't care what you've done in free agency. I don't know. I don't care what you've done in the draft the last couple of years. That guy's never going to have enough defensive linemen in his mind. I think Jalen Carter is a guy that's fascinating because he's got a little bit of off-the-field stuff. But is it enough? I don't know. It's different when you're weighing the quarterbacks off the field stuff and the defensive players off the field stuff, whether teams tell you that or not. That's the reality. Carter could be a lot of fun because he was an absolute monster at Georgia last year. But to, to be honest, Jake, I, I just think I think it's going to be Levis or Richardson. I just think. I mean, I tend to agree. Too cute because we have too we have too much time to talk about this, you know. But it's just it's going to be a quarterback because of the guy at the end of the day who is at the very top. Ursay really wants a rookie quarterback. So my second question for you, Zach, which I've asked a lot of people, and maybe I've asked you this, so I apologize if it's redundant. Tigers on the grounds. But, okay. <laughs> the, the world has stopped. Looking pristine. Um, Zach, do you believe this is the year the Colts take a quarterback because this is the year that the quarterback riches are there and you can't miss out, or – because they painted themselves into a corner where they can't wait any longer. I think it's the latter. And I know that Chris Ballard hates being boxed in. He hates being forced into picking a certain position or a certain part of the field. That's just not his MO. He doesn't panic for, for right or wrong, right? I mean, he, it's cost him. Last year they wouldn't upgrade it at left tackle or right guard, and it, it you know, buried the season. Um I think there is quarterback talent in this draft. There's no home runs. But the one thing I picked up last week from the owners meeting is that was fascinating. From the Colts' side of things, just because they draft a quarterback this year does not mean they won't be willing to draft a quarterback next year. Now, that's very rare, but it's happened. Remember the Cardinals a couple years ago took Josh Rosen 10th? What did they do a year later? They had a terrible season. He was terrible, and they drafted Kyler Murray first overall. I'm not saying that's going to happen. But let's think about this. If one of these guys doesn't pan out, and it's, it's, it's going to be way too soon, a year in, to decide that, but who's going to be out next year in the draft, right? Caleb Williams, Drake May, is, is, if he's as good as everyone thinks he is. And maybe if the quarterback does work out and does show some signs of promise, I still don't think the Colts are going to win a lot of games. If that puts you high in the draft, are you going to have a chance at Marvin Harrison Jr., who I saw up close and personal in Columbus a few weeks ago, my God, like he is his, he's his dad, but he's bigger. Like he's just as fast. His routes are crisp. He's going to be the best player in college football this year, probably besides Williams. And, and it just feels like if you could get, if you could get a stud receiver to pair with your young quarterback, that's the way to do it. it a la Cincinnati with Joe Burrow and Chase and a la going back in the days to Peyton and Marvin and Reggie. So I'm getting ahead of myself, but. They're not going to box themselves in. I do feel like there's enough quarterback and talent in this draft for them to roll the dice at four, but it doesn't change what they're thinking next year. We'll see where they're at a year from now. Zach Kiefer from The Athletic. He's with us here on the Payless Slickers Hotline. Zach, you mentioned earlier, you know, Jim Mersey has said, you know, it's going to be a Chris Ballard, Shane Steichen sort of decision. Do you think Ursay has mandated a quarterback draft pick? And then at the same time, he said, you need to take a quarterback you two decide who and how you go about getting that quarterback. Basically, you know, I'm saying you have to take one, but I'll back away from who or how you acquire that guy. I think that's where we're at. I, I, that sounds about right. I, I think he would hesitate to mandate. Now, he, we know the mandates that were laid down about week five and week seven and week ten of last season, right? Like, they lived through that. At least one of them did. Chris Ballard did. And, um the reality is I, I think that he's taken a little bit of a step back. Now, Jim's going to watch film, but he admitted, I'm not going to watch as much as Steichen, and I'm not going to watch as much as Chris. And one of the interesting things he said, 
multiple times in our conversation with him last week was, and this is Jim Erno, Oser, Jim Ursay speaking. He said, this is Shane's offense. This is Shane's scheme. This is his system. So it makes a lot of football sense to let that guy pick the quarterback he's going to be working with. And I think he's going to. I think Jim Ursay, for all the impatience of the last six months, has exercised some here and some prudence. And he stepped back a little bit, right? I mean, this coaching search was absolutely Chris Ballard's. And so I think Jim Ursay is going to step back and allow that to happen. It's a little bit different when you're drafting at the very top of the draft and you have the pick of anyone you want like this team has had four times, right? Not just twice, the ones we all think of, Peyton Manning and Andrew Luck. But, you know, Jim Irsay was the GM that traded a haul for Jeff George. You remember that, Jake. And then going back to 1983, which Jim Irsay, of course, he brought up on Monday night. They picked John Elway, and then that didn't work out, obviously. But this is a little bit different territory for this team. The first time they'll be picking a quarterback in the first round that's not at the number one spot probably in 40-some years. So we'll see what happens. I think he's going to let Chris Ballard and Shane Sykin decide. And I think Ballard, based on his track record and where he's at, is going to give Shane a lot of leeway with this decision. I think the coach is going to have a lot of say. You know my trivia question, Zach. I said it once. I said it a thousand times. The Denver Broncos have never won a Super Bowl with a quarterback that did not get drafted by the Colts. That's a, I, that's a great piece of trivia. Wow. So, you know, they got to hope that. Eight years from now, Will Levis leads the Denver Broncos to the Super Bowl, right? Oh, what about maybe Sam Ellinger? Free agent signing. There you Jacob go. Jacob Eason? There Colts, you go. Colts aren't letting Sam Ellinger go. <laughs> you guys know that. Uh, Zach, we've got 30 seconds. Head, not heart. Is Tiger Woods playing this weekend? Oh, both. Both head and the heart. He is playing the weekend. Hey, it's a second shot course. You guys know that. It's all about the greens. It's all about the approach shots. Nobody knows it better than him. I don't care if I'm wrong. I'm going to watch him play this weekend. Zach, thank you, my man. Thanks, guys. Zach Kiefer right there on the Payless Slickers hotline. Uh, white shirt, navy blue pants. Mark Dykton, I think he looks terrific. You're lathered up. <laughs> lathered Between Tiger and, up. and Micah Shrewsbury coming up in a matter of minutes, you are We've you got are Micah go. Shrewsbury in five minutes, correct? Yep. I'm looking forward to that conversation. Lathered I'm, up. Have I mentioned I'm very happy he's the head coach of Notre Dame men's basketball? We have the images to prove that. You know what he's lathered up with? Hmm. Out of spring. Oh, God. <laughs> the Morning Checkdown. Omaha! 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 On 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. Not to feed into this, but I do use Irish Spring. That is my body wash of Really? Uh-huh. Are, are you a soap or, or body wash guy? Uh, Just the Irish Spring body wash. Like bar, I mean, bar, bar soap? No, or the... no. No bar. Body wash. We've got two players under par. One is an optometrist named Matthew McLean from Don't, Ireland. Why? And in second place is Russell Hen- Henley, the pride <laughs> of Georgia. That would be a bulldog. Uh, those are the two under par so far. Can you see more clear on shot A or B? Better or worse? <laughs> oh, Mark, come on. Well, <laughs> you keep bringing me Jeez. down the road. <laughs> I mean, uh-huh. Pacers lose to the Knicks last night, 138-129. Indiana's now 34-46 and on the year. Uh, they scored quite well last night. Obviously could not defend, continue to rest guys. The Knicks sat out a bunch of guys as well. Uh, jumbled tank standings here as we enter the final weekend of the regular season. For the Pacers, if you want to see them again in person, tomorrow night against the Pistons, Jay Nivey. Had a really nice rookie year for Detroit, and then it's at New York Sunday afternoon to close out the year. You're looking for contact lenses. I do feel like the going to the optometrist. I I don't feel dumber <laughs> than when I go to the optometrist. Like, Is this better or worse? I'm like, can you go back a second? Hold on. And I feel so stupid. What if you memorize the chart? That's what I always want to know. What if you're a ringer? Yeah, I think I have A P O something or other. Guy read the other end of Will you just nine? read off some baseball scores? <laughs> sure. Uh, Cubs and Reds yesterday were rained out. Mercifully, and the Cubs actual or the the Reds today in Philadelphia. That game has also already been postponed due to inclement weather. So um, the Reds just sit around idle for a couple of days. Braves over the Cards yesterday, five two. It was the Brewers over the Mets, seven six. White Sox over the Giants, seven three. Yankees doubled up the Phillies, four two. Now, in terms of our race for the PBR, Orioles a loser to the Rangers, five two. Also, Kevin's Oakland Athletics on the short end against the Cleveland Guardians, 6-4. Arizona Diamondbacks were off yesterday. Indianapolis Indians and Louisville Bats also rained out yesterday. That game is postponed. Michael Shrewsbury joins us next. I'm excited. Guys, solve your ED.
You're listening to Kevin and Query on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. That song makes me smile, Jake Query. Key word is the fan, right? Yeah, I don't know if professionalism will be practiced here in the next 10 minutes or so. Apologies up front for that. (laughs) At least you have your shirt on. Uh, Micah Shrewsbury, the head coach of the Notre Dame men's basketball program, a statement that I love to hear, uh, joins us now. Coach, um, you said during your press conference you, your hobbies are family and basketball. Uh, a glimpse into myself, my hobbies are family, Notre Dame basketball, and Tiger Woods. And it depends on the day in that order. So um, as a diehard Notre Dame basketball fan, I am very excited that you are the new men's basketball coach. Oh, I, I appreciate that. I'm uh, I'm glad I can glad I can be on with you guys today and and talk some Notre Dame basketball. And how about this, uh, Cathedral grad? And my uncle used to be the priest at St. Matthew, and I believe you were a warrior back in the day. <laughs> I was a warrior back in the day, so we're we're going way back with with a lot of uh, past hits. Like if you would tell me your your favorite baseball player back in the day was Razor Shine, then. <laughs> We're all over it. Former Indianapolis Indian, right, Jake? Razor Shine. Razor Shine. Not that. That's right. I'd have to go Griffey on that one. Hey, Coach, I'm fascinated by this because you might have the record. I mean, there, Royce Waltman is probably up there as well, but for the most Indiana institutions where you've coached, which I think is cool, right? So I'm looking at. I mean, you played at Hanover. Did you play for Beitzel at Hanover? I did. Okay. I did. And then you were at Wabash as an assistant. You were at DePaul as an assistant. Was that – I'm trying to think of who was at DePaul at the time. Would that have been – Waltman wasn't there Coach yet, was Finland. he? I, I worked for uh, for Bill Finland. So I've worked for some of the some of the greats um, in Indiana Indiana basketball. With um, And also, Skip, I worked my first year right out of, right out of college. I worked for Todd Sturgeon at the University of Indianapolis for a year. So um, Todd Sturgeon, Mac Petty at Wabash, Bill Finland at DePaul, uh, a lot of great Indiana coaches. Well, and with that, and then obviously, you know, Brad Stevens, Matt Painter. I mean, so I was curious about this because the 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 obvious answer here is, is going to be Painter or Stevens. But – which coach do you find yourself in the middle of a coaching practice, in the middle of a session, in the middle of a timeout in a game, when you reflect back, do you think to yourself, you know what, I take a little piece of what I learned from blank coach more than people would guess. Which one most influenced you? Yeah, I, I would probably say um, probably Brad, uh, just because of how much time I was with him. Right, We were – we were together for 10 years, you know, four at Butler, six in Boston. Uh, so a lot of things like, and I don't know if they're um, intentional or not, but a, a lot of things that I end up doing or how we play or things I say are, are a lot like him. Uh, but Coach Painter in the same way, uh, a lot of the stuff we do in practice, um, some of the things that we emphasize are – are really important, right? Because, you know, he's got a program that's won at a high level. Um, why not try and mimic some of those things? He's Michael Shrewsbury. He's head coach of the Notre Dame basketball program. He's with us here on the Pay Less Slickers hotline. Coach, I was reading something, I think, with maybe one of your Penn State beat writers when you first took the job, and you were sharing a story with him about – um, you know, here's a picture of a recent Indiana high school semi-state game. I want to say it was Kokomo and Penn, and, and you were like, "This is kind of what it means to be back in this state for me. Um, it's getting back into this culture, this atmosphere that you know, obviously, a huge part of your life has been about." Do you mind sharing that story of, of you know when this opportunity arose and, and trying to explain to people, you know, in this state, it's just too good to pass up. It is, and. Um, I, you know, I, like we talked about at the start, I've been fortunate to work um, at a lot of schools in this state, and um, and and have if I haven't worked there, I've played there, and I've been in a lot of these arenas. But you know, I grew up Indiana basketball, an Indiana basketball kid, and living in Jeffersonville, Indiana, we had season tickets to uh, those games as you know as a youth growing up, and. 
you know, the Hoosier Hills Conference back in the day. I watched Damon Bailey come through there and play. I watched Pat Graham come through there and play. Um, just a lot of, like, names that people would remember. Uh, and then moving to Indianapolis and getting a chance to, you know, see all the great Indianapolis players. My sister uh, went to Lawrence North when they were winning a championship with Eric Bontross and Todd Leary and those guys. Uh, playing, you know, myself at Cathedral and in the Hinkle Regional against, you know, one of those great Ben Davis teams in 1995. Like, those are things that you remember. Uh, those are things that you grow up and when the gym is packed. So when I saw the video of of what the semi-states looked like this year, um, it's just – you can't explain it. You can't explain it, uh, but everybody from Indiana understands what you're talking about, right? It's, it's just understood the feeling that everybody has, you know, talking about high school basketball, talking about college basketball, talking about the Pacers in this state. You look at the, your guys' style of Penn State, a lot of shooters on the floor. I, mean, I think a lot of kind of versatile parts, you know, offensively. You guys are pretty gifted. Um is that kind of what you're wanting to coach towards that side of the floor? Um, was that just given the personnel that you had? Because it was a, a lot different than I think how a lot of Big Ten teams played this past season. Yeah, we, we tried to be a little bit different. And some of that was based on personnel. Uh, some of that was, you know, based on what how the, the roster that we had, the best way for us to try and win some games in this league. And – you know, we didn't have we didn't have Zach Eady or Trace Jackson Davis or, or Hunter Dickinson. Um, you know, we played our point guard at center a lot and let him post up and then spread the floor with shooters. And you know, that that's how we want to continue to attack, right? It may not be our point guard, it could be somebody else, but we wanna try and put you at a disadvantage and make you help in different ways, whether that's through pick and rolls, whether it's post ups or whether it's having guys that can beat their man off the dribble. So spacing is is huge. Shooting is huge and paramount. So, you know, I love being back here in Indiana because I can find some shooters. I can find (laughs) some guys that are going to be able to make shots and help us spread the court. And kind of going back to our old Butler days, that's, that's how we had a lot of success was those guys from Indiana, homegrown kids that could make some shots. And then we mixed it up with some, some other kids that were really good players, and um, we had a lot of success playing that way. You know, when I looked at, and I think back to Butler and their runs, Coach, the thing that always amazed me was Butler would just hang around games, and then late in, in moments, they always knew where the loose ball was going to be or where the rebound angle was. And I know that that sounds weird, but it, it literally looked like I was watching a team that in the last four minutes of a game had already wa- seen the script and watched the film on what exactly was going to happen. So they were always a half a second ahead of the other team and would then beat Michigan State or beat Syracuse or beat you know whoever it might be to, to Kansas State you know in the tournament. And I saw that in your Penn State team. Now, is that me just over romanticizing it, or was there something about the preparation that you learned? in the bowels of Hinkle Fieldhouse that you've carried with you? No, I, I think uh, I think that does hold true. And we tried to play that way. Um, you know, we, one of the sayings that Brad would always say is the game honors toughness. And, you know, what whatever, whatever happened from the 40-minute mark all the way down to the four-minute mark, we knew that we would get tougher and tougher as the game went on. And if you stay true to that, you stay true to your discipline, uh, you do the things that you're supposed to do, then the ball starts to bounce your way at the end, right? Then, um, you know, the, the, the crazy plays start to happen. Guys are stepping in and taking charges. Guys are getting rebounds they're not supposed to get. Uh, the ball kicks off somebody's shoe, and it rolls over to you like that. Those are the things that they start to happen. You know, you think it's some kind of magic, but it's really it's just your discipline. It's just your toughness. It's just your belief as a team. And, you know, we had that magic when we were at Butler, and we had the same thing on our run this year at at Penn State where those guys really believed if we played the right way, good things would happen. And more times than not, it did. Your father is a respected businessman in the area. He owns 
an environmental engineering company, if I'm not mistaken, that he has you know a number of people working underneath him. He's the founder of a successful business. How much, Coach, of growing up under the same roof as someone like that pays off for you now in understanding how to lead people? Yeah, a lot. You know, I've I've watched him for a really long time growing up, and even you know, as he was a city councilman when when I was a young kid in Jeffersonville, to moving into state government and city government in Indianapolis. Um, the biggest thing that that you kind of take from him is <clears throat> his leadership style. Um, like really empathetic, really genuine, uh, caring about the people that he's serving. Right. And, and that's, you know, that's what I'm trying to do is, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the leader of, of this place, but I'm also trying to serve. I'm also trying to, to serve the, the kids that we have here to try and help them reach their goals. Um, I'm trying to use this platform as the head coach of Notre Dame to maybe get other messages out that can help other people. Um, I'm also trying to, you know, let young assistant coaches that have dreams um, see what they can do and what they can accomplish. And, you know, I got to do things the right way, right? There, there's a lot that I put on my shoulders to make sure that we're doing everything that we can, doing it the right way. Uh, but giving a guy a dream that, you know, four years ago I was an assistant coach and, and now, you know, I'm the head coach at, at the University of Notre Dame. Um, you can you can reach your dreams, you can reach your goals if you if you do everything the right way, if you handle things the right way, if you treat people the right way. And uh, that's all I'm trying to do. And, uh, you know, hopefully good things will, will happen and good things will follow. Safe to say I'm quite excited that Michael Shrewsbury is the head coach of my favorite basketball team. He's with us here on the Payless Lickers Hotline. Coach, last one from me. You've mentioned before, you know, Brad Stevens, Matt Painter, you got them on speed dial. If you had to narrow it down to one item, the, the biggest thing you've learned from each of them, what would it be for Brad? What would it be for Matt? You know, um, I would say with, with Coach Painter, he is so – Right, he, he's been at Purdue for a long time, and the success that's followed him. Um, so I just sit back and look at the program and how he runs it, how he treats his players, how he treats the guys that he works for, how he gives them a voice and allows them to really learn. He taught he he gave me a lot of responsibility. Like I'm not a head coach without him. Um, he he gave me a lot of freedom to do things, to try things. Even when he took the heat for it, um, that like that takes a, a great person. Um, so how you know how I run my program, um, how I do things is is really very similar to him um, in the things that that he does. You know, with his program at Purdue, um, I think stylistically, I play a lot closer to Brad and in his teams and. Uh, what they were doing, the things we were doing at Butler. I, I look back and teams in college basketball are just doing them now <laughs> or, or running similar actions that we were doing in 2008, 9, 10, 11. Like, um, I think Brad was a little bit ahead of his time as, a, as an offensive coach. Um, so I try and take some things from him stylistically, what we did at Butler, what we did um, in Boston, and try and do it to the best of our abilities here. Lastly, Coach, I'm sure you were told of it. Mark probably tipped you off to it. When it was rumored that you were in the running for Notre Dame, Kevin Bowen said on these airwaves, if Micah Shrewsbury is hired, I am so excited. I will come in, bring Long's Donuts, and pass them out while wearing no shirt on the air. It was <laughs> one of the most horrific things I've ever seen. Um, I, I beg to differ. Well, so my question for you is, uh, Coach, is that flattering or terrifying? Um, I mean, you know what? It is, it is flattering. Uh, cause I, you know, I wasn't there. So I didn't, I didn't have to see him with his shirt off. Uh, but you can go uh, to the grotto and maybe pray that you are thankful that you were not there. Do you want him to come up to a game and maybe pull a putty and like paint like a huge clover leaf on his chest and go be in the studio? If you, if you, if you bring some Long's Donuts with you, man, <laughs> I'm never one to pass up anything with food, right? That's, that's what like. I've been really excited about the small things of being back in Indiana 
um, you know, I'm excited to turn the corner and see Steak and Shake, see Penn Station. Uh, but to hear you guys say Long's Donuts, like – if you bring some long donuts up here, I might paint a shamrock on my chip. <laughs> well, if the steak and shake's open, grab it while it's there. I'll tell you that much, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Coach, congrats. Yeah, I can tell just, you know, listening to your press conference and listening to this conversation how much it means to you to be back in the state. And as an unapologetic, diehard Notre Dame basketball fan, I know there's not many of us, but my brother and I are absolutely thrilled that you are the head man in South Bend. So congrats on that. Good luck with a busy off season. And can't wait for uh, things to get underway this fall. Appreciate you guys. Go Irish. It's Michael Shrewsbury right there on the Payless Liquors Hotline. I am happy Tiger Woods tees off in a half hour. That makes me even happier. We'll be back one final time. Uh, Pop quiz, right? Sure. We gotta just... Kevin needs to go wipe himself <laughs> down. I'm going to go take a shower. Pop quiz, 317-239-1070. and 107.5 The Fan. Have you studied? Can you handle the pressure? Sharpen your pencils. It's time for the Pop Quiz with Kevin and Query. Brought to you by Jiffy Lube, Indiana's favorite oil change since 1985. I'm still smiling. (laughs) I'm trying to think of what, like, would be the... What interview we would have to be doing... And what would have to be on the screen for me to be that excited? Yeah, I'm equally staring at Tiger Woods as I was paying attention to Michael Shrewsbury. By the way, pop quiz, 317-239-1070. Give us a ring. We'll close out the show with that. I Obviously, Jake, I'm the wrong person to ask because I'm extremely biased. But I feel like John's tweet right here has some accuracy to it. John goes, I've never followed Notre Dame basketball that closely. Yeah, John, you're not the only one. Uh, but I think I'm going to have to now. Coach Shrewsbury sounds like he's a perfect fit. Yeah, it's hard to argue that. You you said it's that heck, with a bit a, of um. It no, almost sounded like you had a burden in saying I, that. No, well, I'm not a Notre Dame fan, but it's a home run hire for sure. Gosh, I love that. I mean, you know they they're going to be pretty good. You know, look, I liked Mike Bray a great deal though, and I. I rooted and I, hard. I did as well. As I, know I rooted my... hard for Notre Dame in that game against Kentucky. I mean, man, was I rooting for them to beat Kentucky that year. I feel like Kevin's going to send some Long's Donuts to South Bend. Send? I mean, I'm going to tell Deliver? Matt. Well, I'm going tell Maddie. i got to take the kids up 31 tomorrow, it sounds like. <laughs> Just keep your shirt on is all we ask, right? Get pulled over around Kokomo with the shirt off. Uh, number one. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first time that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. What, what, what is it? The hippo? Hip hugger. Hip, hip hugger. Yeah. Uh, number one through eight, Kevin. Tiger going for number six. The six green jacket is who, Mark Dykton? Bill. What's up, Bill? Hey, Bill. Bill. Yes, sir. Turn down your radio, Bill. Bill. Turn down your radio. Bill, okay. you wouldn't happen to be Bill Shrewsbury, Micah's father. 
Would you? <laughs> no, I am not. Bill, have you called the program before? Yes, I have. Okay. And, and you've have we played Get to Know Your Listener with you? No. Okay, well, we're, we're up against it a little bit here, but we'll do it quickly. Uh, how old a fellow are you, Bill? 62. 62-year-old Bill, okay. Oh, he's um, Sandy Lyle's age. So that, my rough math tells me that that would mean that you graduated from high school somewhere around the year of, I'm, I'm trying to think quickly here, uh, what, 79, 80, somewhere in there? 78. 78, okay, and that was from what school? Harry E. Wood High School, Woodchuck. Oh, yeah, that, now that's, what year did it close? 78. Oh, wow. so, okay. And then, so you you just torched the place down. That that was basically <laughs> just south of the Slippery Noodle. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. Really? I, I never knew that. Yeah. Um, and then kids that went, like, your, your kids younger than you then ended up at what school? Would it be manual? Manual, uh, tech high school. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then lastly, Bill, what line of work were you in after high school? Uh, I went to work at a factory for, for Kroger's, a food manufacturing okay. plant. Well, that's cool. Bill, do you have any rooting interest in the Masters? I'd love to see Tiger Woods finish in the, in the money. Bill, I love you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right, Bill, here we go with question number one. You ready? Yes. Speaking of the Masters that is underway this morning, who is the defending champion? Is it Hideki Matsuyama, Scotty Scheffler, Dustin Johnson, or Patrick Reed? Patrick Reed. Think about guys that sound like they, they would have been Purdue centers. Uh, Duffy. Think about, like, on Gilligan's Island, the boat was the blank, blank minnow. The SS minnow. Mm-hmm. Uh, options yeah. again. Hideki Matsuyama, Scotty Scheffler, Dustin Johnson, oh, or Patrick Reed? Mr. Scheffler. <laughs> all right. I guess, yeah, Bill, yes, sir. Bill could go for five as long that as Tiger bad. finishes in the money, man. That's all that matters. All right, Bill. The Knicks, right. they became the first team in NBA history to have three players score 30 points with each making five threes or more in the same game. They did that last night against the Pacers. The Knicks' exclusivity in the club did not last the night, though, as another NBA team had three 30-point scores with five threes apiece, and they partied on Bourbon Street afterwards. Was it the Hawks, the Clippers, the Mavericks, or the Pelicans? The Pelicans. Okay. Question number three. Elvis Andrews of the Chicago White Sox collected his 2000th career hit, and the Sox win over the Giants yesterday. He is one of just four active Major League players with 2,000 or more Major League hits. Which of the following, who was an NL MVP and played for the Indianapolis Indians, is not on the list? So this is the player of these four that does not have 2,000 hits. Andrew McCutcheon, Joey Votto, Miguel Cabrera, or Nelson Cruz? Uh, Cabrera. Okay. The Razor Shines drop by Michael Shrewsbury. Yeah, how about that? Uh, All right, number three. Number four here, Bill, NL, reigning NL Cy Young Award winner Sandy Alcantara pitched the first complete game of the Major League Baseball season on Tuesday night. Alcantara led the majors with six complete games last season. Since 2000, only one pitcher has thrown 10 complete games in a season. Is it Clayton Kershaw, R.A. Dickey, James Shields, or LeVon Hernandez? Let's go with Dickey. Okay. Last question for you. Connor McDavid, by the way, you just, Bill, you sound like a fun guy. You sound like a nice guy. Would you like to come to our PBR party? Absolutely. Okay, there you go. Uh, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisteel, and Ryan Nugent Hopkins have all scored 100 points for the Edmonton Oilers this season. Household names. The last NHL team to have three 100 point scores in the same season was the 95 96 Pittsburgh Penguins. Mario Lemieux, Yarmir Yager, were two of the three penguins. Which of the guys was the third? Sergei oh, Zuboff, yeah. Ron Francis, Ron Francis, or Ron Francis? I'll try Ron Francis. Okay, he'll go with Ron <laughs> Francis there. Bill's or, intelligence, they should have kept that high school open a <laughs> little yeah. bit longer here. The, no, they couldn't get anybody smarter yeah, after Bill. They're like, shut it down, right? Touche. Were you valedictorian in 78? Were you the last valedictorian of Wood High School, Bill? Man, no, I was not. He was homecoming king, leading scorer in the That's basketball, right. bat three in the baseball order. Uh, Scotty Scheffler is the defending champion. That is correct. New Orleans Pelicans was correct as well. Yes!
That's a wild night in the NBA, Scotty. Uh, Ron Francis obviously was correct, but it was James Shields in terms of the baseball question, and then Andrew McCutcheon, the other baseball question, does not have 2,000 hits. Thanks, Bill. Bill's a cool guy. You don't get to come back tomorrow. You don't even get come a back anytime, Bill. of our home game. You're a complete loser. <laughs> have I mentioned I'm happy? Oh, not since 9.54. Uh, 22 minutes till Tiger puts a tee in the ground. Over, gonna, under, what What are we going with, folks? 72 and a half is what Vegas is saying for Tiger. Even par would be 72. I'll say over. Yeah, he'll go over today. Gosh, you guys are just... You're going to be driving to Bloomington. How are you going to handle he'll this? He'll be two right over now? today and then three under tomorrow. No, 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 no. Tiger Woods shoots 70 today. Okay. How about he breaks the course record? Let's just go there. Now, you want me to be naked tomorrow? Oh, what? Okay. Okay. I would save that for Monday show, but course record. How about Mike Weir of the Alex? Oh, this is awkward. Hey, shoots 35 in the front nine. That's one under par. You. We've got one, two, three. We've got nine, eight. Eight guys under par right now. If you've now, never seen the elect at the Raskeller, it's like being at Augusta National on day three. Uh, Wonderful. The high scores right now, Kevin Nahn, Alex Norin. So far, very early from Augusta National. We'll recap it all. We'll round out the week. Everybody have a great Thursday. Thank you to Micah Shrews.